Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Garrett Smith, also known as the nutrition detective around these here YouTube parts. Whoo. Okay. So today, episode 142, we're going to be going over epilepsy and seizures and the root causes of them as they relate to the same toxicities and deficiencies and subclinical cholestasis, as some people call it, which is the leaking of your toxic bile into your bloodstream and therefore affecting any tissue in your body, anywhere the blood goes, which is everywhere, right? So we're going to cover all of those things today. And one of the things that I want to make sure you guys can see in terms of does this work, uh, Joe has the link to the YouTube video where I go over a mother's testimonial of her child and how we, at the last time she wrote the testimonial, we he had been seizure-free for 15 months. He developed the seizures as a child and then we helped them to go away. So yes, this does work. Now, why did I choose epilepsy or seizures today? Because I'll, I'll be going back and forth between epilepsy and seizures because there's all sorts of different seizures. And people will say, well, do you have a protocol for this type of seizures or this type of seizures or this type of epilepsy? No. People come to me and they ask me if I have a protocol for various conditions. No. We do the same principles and concepts for all health problems. Some people are going to be like, that can't possibly work. Well, it is. It is working and it does work. And we have tons of testimonials all the time of this stuff working. Your health problems, your chronic health issues are toxicities, deficiencies, and the leaking of that toxic bile that was, it's made by your liver. It, toxins are stored in your liver. Your liver tries to get rid of them via the bile. And when that leaks back into your system, it goes everywhere the blood goes, your brain, your heart, your muscles your bones, your organs. Different people show up with different symptoms. The same root causes, the same pattern potentially underlies it. Different people may have different amounts of toxins. Different people may have different amounts of deficiencies. Different people's bile recipes are different. The amount of bile leaking in the system is different. There are many differences in the outcome of it. The symptoms may be very different, but the root causes as if you go back and watch the live streams, I'll show the same patterns with all sorts of diseases. So do I have a different approach for all these individual diseases? No, it's the same concepts. Might somebody be more zinc deficient than somebody else? Sure. Might somebody have more copper toxicity than somebody else? Sure. Might somebody have more vitamin A toxicity than somebody else? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Are these all addressed? Yes. So let's get into it. I got to share my screen again for Joe before we get into it. And then let me make sure I'm on the right window, Joe, first. There we go. Okay. Now, my only disadvantage in this is I don't get to see my screen, but before we start, let me take a sip of my niacin drink. You know, I got a flush while we're on here. We will go over nicotinic acid, AKA flush niacin as we go. But right now I'm going to take my lactoferrin pills. Yes, I take two at a time. Yes, I've, yes, I kicked my own butt at the start of taking lactoferrin pills when I jumped up to two at a time very quickly. And then I'm going to drink it right here. If you can see the color of this, this is, um, the Naya Soda, I think Kelsey calls it Naya Soda Black now because she's been making all sorts of different formulas. She gave me kind of one of her early versions, a prototype here. And uh, when I'm behind on time and I don't want to make all my combo powder mix of my niacin drink, I've been finding this really convenient to take now. So anyway, let's start flushing. Okay, let me make sure I don't have any charcoal on my face now. Okay, so 
Let me just look and see that everything looks okay. Okay, here we go. So what? one of the things before I get into this, if you want to review what toxic bile theory is, which is everything we're basing this on, watch live streams number 53 or number 71, or even better, watch both of them so that you can understand what we're about to talk about. I always like to give a quick overview of it each time, but this is the quickest overview I can give. So if you want more details, then go to those episodes. So your liver, right? Everybody talks about the liver detoxing things. Just because your liver gets a hold of something doesn't mean that the waste products, think of it as like a sewage treatment plant. A sewage treatment plant gets a hold of sewage and it might process it, but that doesn't mean that that whatever, you know, the sewage treatment plant has waste itself that it has to get rid of. Super toxic stuff, right? They're probably concentrating that toxicity in the waste of the sewage treatment plant. The sewage treatment plant still has to get rid of that. Or like nuclear waste, right? They got to get rid of that. Really dangerous stuff. So your liver turns, puts all the toxicity it can to uh, this trying to get rid of into the bile. The bile is supposed to go into your guts and preferably the best way to get rid of the bile is to poop it out. This is why pooping is so important to your health. So you want to poop the bile out. However, the bile is so toxic in time as you, as, as you get more toxicity in you, or you take more meds or you get more shots, if you know what I mean, or if you um, get more nutrient deficient or you get more well, I already said toxicity, but as all these things become worse, your detox system slows down. Your bile becomes even more toxic. Your bile starts eating holes, leaks in the very liver cells that make the bile. I can start to feel the redness coming on in my face. Um, that's the flush if you don't know. And then, uh, so it starts to eat holes even in the liver cells that make it. It eats holes in the tiny bile ducts inside the liver. That's called intrahepatic cholestasis, and that leaks right into your blood from your liver. It eats holes in the bile ducts, the big bile ducts that carry it to the intestines. It eats holes in your gallbladder. It eats holes in your gut. Leaky gut is bile eating holes in your intestines, and then it leaks into that. If bile goes backwards up into your stomach, I've shown research that your stomach can absorb bile directly. What does it look like when bile eats holes in your stomach? We call them ulcers. You may have bile in your stomach causing you nausea, vomiting, coming up and giving you a cough, all sorts of things. The bile, And then the, once the bile is in your blood, it goes everywhere. So in a way, once your liver is toxic enough and your bile is toxic enough and that bile eats holes in things and it goes places where it's not supposed to, you become the cause of your own sickness. You are self-poisoning via your toxic bile leaking into your system. Why would conventional medicine, even alternative medicine, never want to talk about this? Well, part of it is they don't, they don't often don't really want patients to take their own responsibility for their problems. And then you're saying, <laughs> as you can see with kind of the, the woke and the PC crowd and all that stuff, you would hate to ever call another person toxic, right? Oh, you're toxic. You know, nobody wants to do that with any, with any real, I mean, there's certain people out there who call everybody toxic. Those are probably the most toxic people themselves. So anyway, this is how your chronic diseases keep going on. And if you take things that are not necessary, like medications, well, I mean, I don't want to say not necessary. If you take things that are not fixing the root cause, such as medications or shots or herbs or other things that are not essential nutrient deficiencies or that are not actually binding to bile, what all you do is you change the, the bile, the toxic bile process. You might change the recipe of it, which changes the presentation. You might change if your liver's making bile, if you make less bile, this is not what we want to do, but if you make less bile, you can relieve your symptoms. There's all these ways as you start to understand toxic bile theory, these will all start to make sense to you. People come and tell me that this is the only thing that ever made sense to them about their chronic health issues. And that's like one of the biggest compliments I can get. So let's head into it. Okay, Joe. Oh, Kelsey's got her shameless plug of links going on in there. Good job, Kelsey. So then 
let's go into this paper. Let me just see if we got it up. Yes, there, wait. There we, yeah, Joe, so pop that up. So first I always like to talk about, so we're going to connect all the nutrient deficiencies and toxicities that I tend to find. And these are the things that we do address in the Love Your Liver program at members.nutritiondetective.com. 99 bucks a year has, people have said they've spent tens of thousands of dollars on doctors and practitioners and therapies and all this stuff. And the little $99 a year Love Your Liver program has helped them more than all of that. So if you're hesitant to spend $99 a year for this information, I can't help you with that level of decision-making. Okay. But it is work. It is reading. It is videos. It is putting things into practice. Do not send people to me who don't want to do any work on their health. Just don't. Don't waste their time. Don't waste their money. Don't waste my time. I'm not here to spoon feed this, all the things that are in the program. Imagine, I'm, imagine how much I'm going to go over right now in about probably three hours. And then think of what's in the Love Your Liver program when I do this every week for three hours. So here we go. Diagnost so now we're going to go into the bile part, okay? Diagnostic utility, the usefulness of diagnosing of serum bile acids. So this is bile in the blood. Serum is basically, just think of it as blood. Serum bile acids in dogs presenting with epileptic seizures consistent with a tier one confidence level diagnosis of idiopathic epilepsy. Idiopathic means they don't know what causes it. I do. But wait, they're saying epileptic seizures consistent with a tier one confidence. That sounds pretty good, right? Level diagnosis of idiopathic epilepsy. Did they just answer their question? How useful to diagnose are serum bile acids in dogs if they don't know the cause, but they know they have epileptic seizures, are they not saying that it's possibly bile in the blood that is causing the epileptic seizures? So do they know the cause now? This seems pretty important. The international veteran. Oh, let me put the link before Joe asks me. The International Veterinary Epilepsy Task Force consensus guidelines recommend performing fasting serum bile acid, SBA, and or serum ammonia measurements as part of a tier one diagnosis of idiopathic epilepsy in dogs. Well, doesn't that, if that's so important, doesn't that mean they know the cause? A total of 233 dogs were included, all dogs diagnosed with clinically significant hepatopathy. This is liver disease had elevations in postprandial, that's serum bile acids. This is, they had more bile in their blood after they ate. So all the dogs with liver problems, significant liver problems, had elevations in bile acids after they ate. Why is it happening after they ate? Because when you eat, you dump bile from the liver. So if you're leaking it, you're going to see it go up in the blood. Does that make sense? With eight of 14 showing elevations in fasting serum bile acids. So they're still they've still got high bile acids in the blood when they're not even when they're not dumping because they ate. Okay. Let's keep going. The study documents the importance of postprandial serum bile acid measurements in the detection of hepatopathies, liver problems, and reveals that non-dynamic blood sampling has a negative predictive value of 91%. That means it's 91% accurate at predicting the dogs who don't have the disease. So that's the right. It's saying the, the, the test says you don't have the disease and the dog doesn't have the disease. It's 91% accurate for that. For detecting elevated postprandial serum bile acids specific to dogs meeting the tier one confidence level diagnosis of idiopathic epilepsy. So they know which dogs pretty well, 91% are not going to have this. Okay, so let's keep going. I never do just one study. Or was it? There it is. So, oh, this was just the negative predictive value. This was this was the defining of the negative predictive value that I, I like to define stuff for you guys so you can understand it. So what does negative predictive value mean? 
Negative predictive value reflects the proportion of subjects with a negative test result who truly do not have the outcome of interest. So a 91% negative predictive value is good. That means you're not getting false positives very much. False positives being they, that the test says you have the disease when you don't actually have it. We don't want false positives. So there's that. So let's go into the next one. We're just going to keep connecting bile with these until we move on to the next thing. So effects of bile acids on neurological function and disease. Joe, I'm going to keep up on it. <laughs> okay. Let me go and find in here. Let me go and click to the next part because this is a big paper. Okay. Get out of here, glass. Come on. Okay. In the brain, S1PR2 knockout mice, these are specifically genetically hybridized mice, have been found to have normal neurological development, but between three and seven weeks of age develop spontaneous and sporadic seizures due to hyperexcitability of pyramidal neurons. In addition, in PC12 cells and in dorsal root ganglion neurons, these are nerves. Nerve growth factor was found to promote cell membrane translocation of this is all this is all complicated. Don't worry about this. Sphingosine kinase to the cell membrane where it would phosphorylate both SPR S1PR1 and S1PR2 and promote neurite extension. Taken together, these findings show that S1PR2 signaling via bile acids may have a role in neurological function. So they're saying bile acids is related to this gene. When after they're born, they develop spontaneous and sporadic seizures. So we're just connecting bile here again to seizures. Let me go find the next one. Because I'm pretty sure it's way down there. Yes. Now, this is a specific condition. Cerebrotendinous xanthomatosis. So follow me along here. This is another connecting... Um, Connecting bile to epilepsy and seizures. Cerebrotendinous xanthomatosis is an autosomal recessive loss of function mutation. So it's just a genetic mutation in the cytochrome 27A1 gene. What do cytochromes do? They detox you. They're part of your liver's detox. So they're saying this problem comes about because people's detox at right here, this specific one, doesn't work well. Okay. So this gene that leads to dysregulation of lipid homeostasis, so that's fat metabolism in your body, decreased bile acid synthesis. When they say decreased bile acid synthesis, they're often only looking at one thing. Okay, they're, they're not looking at all the bile acids. There's like 55 or 56 bile acids that they found in the body. They might look at like five or six, usually. And increased cholesterol and cholesterol accumulation in the brain. Well, 80% of your cholesterol is made by the liver and a lot of it goes into your bile. So if it's accumulating in the brain, there's probably something coming into your blood from the liver. Anyway, this mutation was first identified in 1937 and the prevalence of the disease is estimated to be between three and five cases per 100,000. So not common, but st still a rare disease. The loss of cytochrome 27A1 leads to an elevation of serum cholesterol in patients with CTX. Patients with CTX display neurological symptoms such as dementia, ataxia, epilepsy, behavioral changes, and a variety of other systemic complications affecting the cardiovascular, skeletal, pulmonary, and gastrointestinal organ systems. Let me hold on there for a second. Do you understand if I'm telling you that this bile, this toxic bile, leaks into the bloodstream? It can then affect your brain, dementia, ataxia, epilepsy, behavioral changes, and a variety of other systems. And then we start, and then it goes everywhere else. Cardiovascular is your heart, skeletal is your bones, pulmonary is your lungs, and gastrointestinal organ systems is your gut. Do you understand what they're saying? You have a genetic mutation in a detox enzyme, and it's affecting everything in your body. Toxicity, maybe. This is the bile acid recipe. We're going to go over this because you must understand the bile acid recipe thing. Current therapy is designed to manage CTX. So they're not curing it. 
They're not fixing it. They're just managing it. Include bile acid replacement therapy to restore bile acid synthesis and reduce cholesterol levels. They're actually just, they're, they don't, if they restored bile acid synthesis, they could stop doing it. They wouldn't just be managing it. And giving bile, as we'll go over later, giving bile shuts down bile. Bile acid replacement therapy involves the administration of bile acids such as CDCA, UDCA, this is cholic acid, and this and T, or TCA. Supplementation with CDC or CA has been demonstrated to reduce plasma cholesterol concentrations. Wait, they're they're giving bile acids and it's shutting down the production of something else. Hmm. Changing the recipe and the non-neurological complications associated with CTX, although only CDCA supplementation has been determined to reduce the neurological pathology associated with this disease state. So wait, when they supplement with a bile acid and it, it changes the recipe, certain symptoms go down, not, not neurological, but when they give CDCA, that's when they can help the neurological. Are you seeing that they're changing the recipe? That's all they're doing. They're not fixing the problem. They're just changing the recipe. Okay. Unfortunately, although CDCA supplementation may be one of the more effect efficacious treatments for reducing serum cholesterol concentrations in patients with CTX, mortality, or that's, that's risk of death, can still be relatively high in those undergoing CDCA supplementation. Well, that... So they help the neurological complications, but you're still going to have what basically sounds like the same risk of death. And if they give you the other bile acids, then you may get less of the non-neurological complications, but it doesn't fix the neurological stuff. It sounds like they don't know what they're addressing, which is a liver problem to begin with. Oh, I got something in my eye. How'd that happen? Anyway. Therefore, other treatment strategies may be necessary to improve outcomes in patients with CTX with CDCA supplementation with pravastatin or other statins showing some promise. Oh my gosh, they're going to give statins. Statins are the most disastrous med ever. You need to understand that cholesterol is made by your liver to protect you. It binds to other things. Oh, I don't know, like LDL, the bad cholesterol binds to, let's say, oh, I don't know, vitamin A maybe. Did you know that? Yeah, it does. So let's move on. That was kind of a long one, but sorry, I'm just showing you that the bile acid recipe is important. That's, that's how you can take meds or take certain supplements and affect your symptoms. And because it changes the bile recipe and then you stop the med or you stop the herb or whatever. And then the symptoms come right back because you never fixed a dang thing. No one has an herb deficiency. No one has a pharmaceutical deficiency. Pharmaceuticals are based on typically herbal compounds, which means that herbs are weak drugs. Herbs may have less side effects, but they're also weaker than drugs. I'm not advising any of them. If you're going to do herbs, just realize that you're covering up a symptom with it just as much as you would with a pharmaceutical. It's just less likely to have side effects. So let's head into this. Incidence of post-operative seizures with and without levetiracetam pre-treatment in dogs undergoing portosystemic shunt alteration. Oh, I didn't share this. Here, here we go. There we go. Sorry, Joe. Here's the, and then I'll get the link. Okay. So let me, let me define, let me come back to this portosystemic shunt. What is a portosystemic shunt? So you understand that this is showing that, so they're going in, well, let's, let me just, let me do this. Portosystemic shunts are vascular blood vessel anomalies, abnormalities, things that are not normal that connect the portal circulation with the systemic circulation diverting portal blood away from the liver. So let me give you the quick explanation of it. The portal. So, okay. So your guts, your intestines, this is my, 
universal intestine signal. It's like, like think of your large intestine, right? The blood, there's a, there's a specific blood flow from that. So when you are thinking of your diet, you're absorbing nutrients or toxins from your gut because you absorb both of them. Your, your gut doesn't differentiate. Your gut absorbs everything. So does your skin. So things you put on your skin and things you put in your cake hole are going to be absorbed if they can be for better or worse. Don't assume that like your skin is just not going to absorb toxins or that your gut's just not going to absorb toxins. That is ludicrous. It is made to absorb. It is not made to differentiate. So therefore it is up to you to avoid toxins. So you don't put them there to be absorbed. This is also why we say with skin products, if you wouldn't put it in your cake hole, don't put it on your skin because you're going to absorb either way. Okay. So a porto systemic shunt. So normally your guts as they absorb stuff, it goes into what's called the portal circulation. It goes into the portal vein, a big vein that goes right to your liver. Your liver then think of your livers. Like think of the portal vein as like the line to get into the nightclub. The liver there is like the bouncer. So the liver is telling people you can, you can leave or you can come in or, or we're going to send you into you know, maybe it's saying you don't fit the dress code and you can go change and then we'll let you in. Okay. So, but the liver is like the bouncer. So imagine if there was some like back door into the nightclub where problematic people could go around the liver and get into the bloodstream. Like the, what they're saying here is there's actually a blood vessel that goes around the liver. So it's bypassing the liver. What do you absorb? Do you know that you absorb 95% in the standard American diet? You reabsorb 95% of the bile that your liver makes back into the portal circulation that then goes right back to the liver. And it may come back to the liver even worse because of gut biome problems that change primary bile acids, which are less toxic into secondary bile acids, which are more toxic. So now your liver made bile. It dumped it into the gut. Gut microbiome, then some of it's going to process into secondary bile acids, which are more toxic. Okay. Did I get this one, Joe? Let me put, I don't put this link up here. I'll just put this link in here. Sorry. So it's made into more toxic bile in your gut generally. That's where secondary bile acids are made. So then you absorb it into the portal vein. The portal circulation, as it says here, and it goes right back to your liver normally, but this is saying there's a blood vessel escape where it can, it can go around the bouncer and then go right into your bloodstream. So toxic bile, this is, this is basically leaking toxic bile into your bloodstream. It's just, it's doing it through a normal blood vessel. This is a genetic malformation. Okay. There's an easier explanation here I'm going to go over. So a portosystemic shunt. This is written by a vet. Some dogs, unfortunately, and some humans too, have a congenital, so that's like genetic, handed down, hereditary malformation that leads blood vessels to bypass the liver. It's called a portosystemic shunt, but it is also referred to as a hepatic shunt or a liver shunt. Sorry, I keep forgetting to switch my screen. Others have the acquired form of the disease. So you can get it later. Is this like cholestasis, which is toxic leaky bile, hmm. which is typically secondary to severe diffuse liver ailments, usually seen in older dogs. Here's what happens. The abnormal vessels allow blood to go around or through the liver without stopping to clear the blood of its toxins or feed the liver its normal quantity of blood. The toxins then move along to the rest of the body. This is toxic bile theory. This is just, there's just a blood vessel carrying the toxic bile right into the bloodstream. Gosh, do you think this would be bad for dogs? Yeah. Some shunts are simple. A big vessel leading to the liver completely circumvents it. Instead of driving blood through the liver so that it can be cleansed, it gets shunted completely around it. The blood in which all the bad stuff goes in which all the bad stuff goes when it enters the body, just keeps circulating, taking the untreated toxic waste to all the organs and tissues. 
This is called an extrahepatic shunt because it's outside of the liver. Extrahepatic cholestasis means you're leaking bile into the blood from either the bile ducts or the intestines or the di like the, the stomach, like I talked about. So bile ducts, intestines, which includes the stomach, but I'm going to say the stomach as an extra one. You're absorbing the bile. Extrahepatic means outside of the liver. Extra means outside of, hepatic means liver. So they're saying that you can just have a, a blood vessel that goes like completely around the liver into the bloodstream. Extra hepatic shunt is like extra hepatic cholestasis, same thing. But the liver might well have shunts that travel through it too. In these cases called intrahepatic shunts, one or more blood vessel is located in the, in the liver, but does not actually exchange blood with its tissues effectively circumventing it. It's more common in larger breed dogs with and with with and without, I'm assuming larger breed dogs with and with acquired portosystemic shunts. Basically, intrahepatic cholestasis, intrahepatic shunt are going to be basically the same definition. Intrahepatic cholestasis, intra is from within, hepatic is liver. So within the liver, cholestasis is leaking toxic bile. So this means either the liver cells are leaking the toxic bile or the teeny tiny little bile ducts inside the liver are leaking the toxic bile, but it's from inside the liver. This is a bigger problem. This is harder to fix. I've been working on trying to figure out how to kind of differentiate intrahepatic cholestasis from extrahepatic cholestasis based on symptoms. Most people probably have both. So it's not going to really, it's, and, and we fix them both the same way. People who have intrahepatic cholestasis, in my opinion, are more sensitive to triggering excessive bile dumps because it goes right into the bloodstream from the liver. It doesn't even go into the system, into the, into the digestive system. But anyway, so extra hepatic, extra hepatic shunts would be like extra hepatic cholestasis. Intra hepatic shunts would be like intra hepatic cholestasis. Okay. So I want you to think about all the people today where I'm saying chronic disease is linked to toxic bile leaking into your blood. Some of these dog studies are great. It was like the anaphylaxis dogs. If you guys remember when I did my show on anaphylaxis, they actually found holes in the gallbladder, holes in the gallbladder, leaking bile in the anaphylactic dogs. Gosh, do you think a hole in the gallbladder would leak a lot of toxic bile into the bloodstream and then cause a systemic reaction? I think so. So these dogs with portosystemic shunts, animals with portosystemic shunts eventually die of common toxins and infections normal bodies don't stress over. Well, for those of you who have been in the Love Your Liver program a long time, gosh, are you getting problems with common toxins or infections that normal people are getting sick from anymore? No, you're not. Like you're, you're more resilient to all of these things because you have cleaned it out of your system more. But first, they usually show some or all of the following symptoms. So think of America right now. Think of, think of the people you know who are not well. Abnormal behavior after eating. You ever feel bad after you eat? You ever feel real tired after you eat? That has a lot to do with potassium deficiency. We'll go over that. Pacing and aimless wandering. I don't know what would ADHD look like in dogs. Pressing the head against the wall. Well, that there's not a real human behavior that like that. Episodes of apparent blindness. Do we see a lot of eye problems these days? seizures, poor weight gain. Well, this can happen. This, this is, this is significant liver problems. Just so you know, overweight is early liver problems. Underweight is more, sig more significant liver problems, excessive sleeping and lethargy. Gosh, do you know anybody who's sleeping too much or who is chronically tired? If you haven't seen my chronic fatigue syndrome episode, that's a couple back and abdominal dist distension from ascites. This is a liver problem. If you've got a hard belly, a swollen belly all the time. That's what they're talking about here. And this, this is a, this is another thing we went over in the anaphylactic show. Okay. How do they diagnose this bile acid testing bile in the blood? Weird. Let me take another drink. Okay. Let me just finish this.
that is by far the easiest way to take um, niacin, flesh niacin. <clears throat> Tastes a lot better than my mix. My mix has like 10 things in it. So I didn't have time for it. I was already late enough for this show. I don't think there's anything else on this. So I wanted to explain that portosystemic shunt. Let me just see if there's anything else here. No, that's it. Okay, so let's come back here. Now we're on this one. I may have already posted this one. Incidents of post-operative seizures. Gosh, when they when they stitch up things in medicine, when they do surgical things, do they ever cause leaks? Or let's say you already had a blood vessel going around the liver, kind of taking some of the blood pressure, right? So it, it it's more tubes, so you can spread out the pressure. And then all of a sudden doctors go in and they close off that tube. What does that do to the rest of the system? It increases pressure in the rest of the system. Do things, do pipes blow out if they have too much pressure? Yeah. So seizures with and without this drug in dogs undergoing portosystemic shunt attenuation. Well, in dogs with congenital portosystemic shunts, post ligation seizures can be challenging to treat and often result in mortality. So let, let me just be sure. So dogs who have portosystemic shunts get seizures. And in dogs, after they get the surgery, after ligation means they, they clamped it off. Seizures can be challenging to treat and often result in mortality. Gosh, so are they fixing the problem necessarily or are they making another problem as they go? I mean, they need to do something about it. It's a, they're not formed right. What do they look for in these dogs? Preoperative bile acid and ammonia concentrations, looking to see how, how much bile they're leaking and ammonia they're leaking into the blood. No dog that experienced post-operative seizures survived to discharge from the hospital. Gosh, they must have caused a really bad bile leak. If you haven't seen the anaphylaxis and sepsis show, these dogs are getting septic because their surgery is causing them to either leak or blow out holes other places. Okay. So let's keep going. Oh yeah. So what I did was I did do a search on, um, anti-seizure medications. This is just a simple search on PubMed. If you think PubMed is somehow evil or controlled, you really need to learn like libraries carry books from all sorts of authors. It doesn't mean that the library published those books. Okay. PubMed is an assembly of study abstracts. It does not mean that the NIH funded all these studies. Please, please get that registered. PubMed is a library of studies. Just because there's NIH at the top doesn't mean it's all published by the NIH. So anyway, liver injury. Liver injury is another name for clint, sub clint, or cholestasis. Liver injury is another term for cholestasis or leaking toxic bile into your system. So the reason I looked this up was because that leveracetam, however you pronounce that long word, I just wanted to show that these drugs will eventually cause problems themselves. Anti-seizure drug-induced liver injury. Valproic acid is an anti-seizure med-induced liver injury. Let's see. There's there's more here. There, this is not a great um, severe drug induced liver injury caused by leviteracetam. Got to say it right. Um, I'm not going to go through too many of these. Oh yeah, discontinuation of leviteracetam and valproic acid due to adverse effects in early post traumatic seizure prophylaxis. They're trying to prevent seizures, and it's causing severe adverse effects. So their effect, so the thing you need to understand is what, what pharmaceuticals do, this is a very important concept. I haven't talked about this much yet, but what, what a pharmaceutical does, a pharmaceutical is a toxin. Think about this. If they say that a pharmaceutical is good for lowering your blood pressure, okay, what they're really saying is that the most common and strongest side effect 
of that pharmaceutical medication is lowering blood pressure. Do you understand? That's pharmaceutical effects. The thing they say it's for is the most common and strongest side effect of it. <laughs> sometimes you get side effects, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you get other side effects. It's a poison that is forcing your body to do something that either it didn't want to do or it couldn't do. So if, as we're saying, the levetiracetam or the or valproic acid or whatever is going to affect the bile, which is what's causing the seizures, it's going to do something to your, it's doing something to your liver that either your liver didn't want to do or it couldn't do. Do things tend to break when you force them to do things they were purposely not doing or didn't want to do? Yeah. Yes, John Dickinson said, which is why off-label use is a thing. Yes, drugs have many, many side effects. So you can use them for different conditions and just hope that you hit the right side effect for that person with the pharmaceutical. So... Again, we're gonna, this is the bile acid recipe that we're changing. I want you to understand this. So if they give bile, they are changing the bile acid recipe. If you take ox bile, you are changing the bile acid recipe. Giving bile tends to reduce bile production. Just like if you take steroids, guys, you reduce your own steroid, AKA testosterone production. You take thyroid hormone, you reduce your own thyroid hormone production. This should not be a difficult concept. So here we go. Anti-convulsant effects of cultures, bear cultured, they mean cultured, bear bile powder in febrile seizure. This is fever induced or heat induced. Febrile seizure via regulation of neurotransmission and inhibition of neurotran neuroinflammation. Natural bear bile powder has been used to treat seizures for thousands of years. So what they did was they, they saw that somebody took some bear bile powder and it stopped seizures. Does that mean it fixed anything? No. It mean, think of the older the medicine, the more it's just addressing symptoms. Because that's all they could go by. They weren't doing like this, you know, some of the science that we're talking about here right now. Well, hardly anybody's doing the science we're talking about here right now. But they just watched and they, they gave it and they're like, oh, these went away. Kind of like pharmaceutical companies do. They're like, oh, this is the most common side effect. Cultured bare bile powder, CBBP, which is produced by biotransformation. Let, let me, actually, I want to go find biotransformation toxic. Let's go look this up. Let me find it. Yes, here we go. Joe, I'll share it. Don't worry. Okay, let me get this link. Biotransformation is the process by which a substance changes from one chemical to another, transformed by a chemical reaction within the body. Metabolism or metabolic transformations are terms frequently used for the biotransformation process. Another term is uh, intoxication. Uh, let me see, where was, what did I want to find? I was looking for, it was, let's see. Okay. Potential complications. Some people get confused in this because they're like, why would our, why would God design us for our liver to make certain things more toxic? Probably God didn't make a mistake. You're just taking in poisons and your liver's doing the best it can to get rid of them. Okay. So here we go. The biotransformation process is not perfect. Detoxification occurs when biotransformation results in metabolites of lower toxicity. The key thing here, in many cases, however, the metabolites are more toxic than the parent substance. A process called 
bioactivation. Occasionally, biotransformation can produce an unusually reactive metabolite that may interact with cellular macromolecules like DNA. This can lead to very serious health effects such as cancer or birth defects. An example is the biotransformation of vinyl chloride into vinyl chloride epoxide, which covalently binds to DNA and RNA, a step leading to cancer of the liver. Hey, do you know what vitamin A turns into? Retinol? Retinaldehyde? It turns into retinoic acids. Do you even know how toxic retinoic acids are? So as you take in vitamin A, beta carotene turns into retin... Well, beta carotene breaks into two retinaldehydes, but we're just going to go over the basics of it. Beta carotene, retinol, retinaldehyde, retinoic acid. Beta carotene by itself, probably not that toxic. Once you start chopping it up and running it through the liver in bioactivation, it becomes more toxic. You ever seen the side effects list for Accutane? That's one of the retinoic acids that is made from beta carotene. You ever seen the side effect list of Retin-A, isotretinoin? It's bad. They, they, and then one of the other retinoic acids you make from it is alitretinoin, nine cis retinoic acid, which is used as a chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is always healthy for us, right? So the uh, bioactivation is another term, but they also call it intoxication, right? There's detoxification, but there's also intoxication where things get more toxic. When you drink ethanol, alcohol, it's not the ethanol that hurts you, that gives you a hangover or that can kill you from alcohol poisoning. It's the acetaldehyde it turns into. So where was I on the bear? Where was I on the bear bile? There we are. Okay, so let's go back here. <clears throat> so, okay, so how did they induce febrile seizures? For those of you in the program, febrile seizures, fever-induced seizures were induced by placing the rats in a warm water bath of 45 and a half degrees Celsius. Any of you guys ever felt really bad, really tired, really unwell after, let's say you were out in the sun too long, or after maybe you went in the sauna too long, or the steam room, or a room was just too hot for a while and you felt really bad? One of the things we talk about with heat is we talk about dumping bile. Heat will trigger a bile dump, which can make you feel worse. They induced febrile seizures by putting them in a warm water bath. I'm telling you that heat induces bile dumping. They dumped bile. They saw seizures. The incidence rate and latency of febrile seizures and hematoxylin eosin staining were conducted for neurological damage. Is it that they were cooking the brain or was it the bile doing the damage to the brain? They looked at the levels of four bile acids. How many did I tell you there were? 55 or 56. They looked at four. Gosh, are they really looking for the problem? So pre-treatments with cultured bare bile um, powder and similarly, what was the N? Is that normal? Is that natural? Natural. Natural bare bile powder significantly reduced the incidence rate and prolonged the latency of febrile seizures. What did I tell you giving bile does? Reduces your bile production. Weird that they pre-treated it, shut down their bile, and they saw less seizures from the bile dumping that they induced with the heat. Additionally, cultured bare bile powder alleviated or made less the histological, the cellular injury induced by febrile seizures in the rat hippocampus tissue. Analyses revealed that sea cultured bear bile powder markedly increased the levels of Tudka, Torokinodeoxycholic acid, Ursodeoxycholic acid, Udka. They give this as a pharmaceutical, which should tell you that it's so good for you, and Kinodeoxycholic acid in febrile seizure rats. The present study demonstrated that cultured bare bile powder had anticonvulsant effects in a febrile seizure rat model. CBBP may protect rats against febrile seizure probably by 
upregulating FXR, which was activated by increasing brain bile acids. They're messing with the whole bile thing. You understand? This can be fixed. I'm going to show you the toxicities and deficiencies that are how we fix this. Okay. Don't, if, if you want to go, here's, here's, let me just say this. If you're out there and you're taking Tudka or you're taking ox bile, or let's say you're getting some like underground source of bear bile. If it is helping your symptoms currently. So, so first what you want to understand is it's helping a symptom. It's changing your bile acid recipe, which changes the presentation of symptoms. Now, if it's helping you, here's, if you were doing the love your liver program and, or working with me or Nathan, or soon to be helping us out as more practitioners would be Kelsey and hope. <laughs> we're going to, we are working on all of it and the plan is to fix it. But if you're doing it as a bandaid or a crutch or an antidote, you can keep doing it. You must understand that you are not fixing the problem and the problem is getting worse underneath it. It's festering. It's slowly getting worse underneath it all. And eventually probably that, that ox bile or the Tudka will stop working. And then you're going to be up a Creek without a paddle because all those months or years you were taking it, the problem was festering and getting worse. And maybe you started taking more of the bile prob the bile supplement to bring it down more until all of a sudden that doesn't work anymore. And maybe even you start noticing that the bile supplement makes it worse. And then you really don't know what to do because if you stop it, you get worse. But if you keep taking it, you get worse. This is what happens with band-aids and antidotes and crutches. The goal would be what we do with people is I would say that if you were working with me or you're doing the love your liver program, or if you're doing any kind of crutch or antidote or any of that stuff, I'm not against them. The whole point is that underneath it all, you're working on the toxicities and the deficiencies to fix those. And then what you find is that the symptoms start improving. And then your job using your big brain is to go, oh, I don't need as much of this thing that Dr. Smith says is a band-aid or a crutch. So I can reduce my doses. Wow, I don't need it anymore. Or I need less of it. And I'm doing fine. And then eventually you're off of it because the toxicities and the deficiencies that were causing it in the very first place are now gone. Do you understand? You following me? This is what... We don't yank people off of things. If you are medicating an issue, whether it's with a supplement or whether it's with a medication, we fix the underlying problem as much as we can in the background so that your symptoms get better so that then you can take yourself or wean yourself off of the, the antidote or the crutch. You understand? So if you're out there yanking yourself off of things, thinking that Dr. Smith doesn't want me on this, I didn't say that. I don't yank people off of things. If it's, I, I do usually ask them, is it helping? Is it helping the issue you're taking it for? And if you say yes, then I'd say, okay, keep taking it. If you can take less, you know, to begin with, great. But as you do the program and you see the underlying symptoms improve, then you can start reducing your dose because you're actually seeing that you don't need it as much. We do this with thyroid hormone. We do this with antidepressant meds like SSRIs. We do it with benzos. We do it with female hormone stuff. We, you know, this is how we do it. B vitamins, unnecessary B vitamins. Most of them are absolutely unnecessary to take, especially not mega doses of them. So let's keep going. I'm, I'm not even off the first window yet. Bile acids and FXR. This is FX. Well, I just wanted to go over FXR because we went over FXR in that last one. They were saying that was the target. Novel targets for liver diseases, right? Let's go find where I marked. Oh, wait, you're taking a bile acid supplement? 
What's it doing? In the liver and intestine, bile acids suppress their own synthesis. Let's read that again. In the liver and intestine, wait, if you took a supplement, a pill of bile acids, where's it going? Oh, your intestines, which then go into the portal circulation and go right to your liver. In the liver and intestine, bile acids suppress their own synthesis. They kind of said it right there. Now, let's just say bile was the cause of your diabetes, your high cholesterol, your inflammation, your excess scarring. So if you reduce the bile production by the liver, could you help your diabetes short term? Yes. Could you help your cholesterol short term? Yes. Could you inhibit inflammation that's caused by the toxic bile leaking into your bloodstream? Yes. Could you scar and fibrose less? Yes. Eventually, all that backed up bile that's not getting made is going to blow apart the dam. It's going to break apart the dam, burst the dam, and then you're going to have it going everywhere and you're not going to know what to do because suppressing it is not working anymore. Disruption of bile acid homeostasis leads to severe pathological outcomes. Isn't that what I was just saying? Including cholestasis, leaky, toxic leaky bile, hepatic steatosis, that's fatty liver, fibrosis is cirrhosis, and liver tumors or cancer. Hmm. Wait, so if you, if you take bile acids and you suppress their own synthesis, would that be disruption of bile acid homeostasis by definition? Yeah. Yeah, it would be. Let me go see if there's anything else in here that I wanted to go over. Nope, that was it. Let me see if this was just a search I did. Oh, this is just leveracetam. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not worried about this. So we can get rid of this one. Get rid of that one. Yeah, we'll keep that. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Finally. Okay, so wait, did I just, oh, I just turned off my share. Hold on, Joe. I got it. I see it. Share the screen. Let me go find it again. It's not the right one yet. Okay. Now, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but let me explain your gut microbiome. Because a lot of people love to say everything starts, you know, even naturopathic doctors like myself were taught in med school that I'm mean, actually the real, the real naturopathic medical school, not the uh, correspondence course. Um, buy a certificate through a male naturopathic school. <laughs> They're different. They're quite different. NDs are licensed in something like 17 states right now where they actually have a medical license. Um, but correspondence course NDs are everywhere. If you're out there and you're listening to this and you're understanding it and you're using it with your people, kudos. Because most licensed NDs aren't using it either. So what, how does the gut microbiome, do you guys, do you guys remember how I was talking about how when you dump bile into your gut, it hits your gut microbiome, your gut bacteria, your probiotics for better or worse, and it can turn into more toxic secondary bile acids. Okay. So you make the toxic bile. Some of it goes into your gut. It goes to your gut microbiome. Let's say you have toxic bile already. It hits your gut microbiome. If you have toxic bile already, what kind of gut bacteria is it going to feed? The gut bacteria that loves toxic bile, right? And the gut bacteria that really doesn't like or survive well in toxic bile is going to die off or be less. Does that make sense? And then your more toxic bile, now that it's turned into secondary bile acids, some of it, it then is absorbed by the portal circulation Think of portal as meaning liver and it goes right into your liver again. So you just, you absorb 90 in a standard American diet, you reabsorb 95% of your bile. You poop out 5% of it. So you reabsorb 95% of your bile. It goes right back to the liver. Now your liver has to deal with toxic bile that has been made more toxic. And then your liver has to process that again. Do you see how much work this is on the liver? So the liver makes bile that is now more toxic. It goes down into your gut to do the same thing again. And now it comes back to your liver and it's even more toxic. 
This is why the more toxic you become, the slower your detox gets. You're not as good at getting rid of toxins and you're actually turning your toxic bile into more toxic bile. And this is how, and then you leak the toxic bile and then it can affect everything in your body. And so this is where, when they say like, as they say in naturopathic medical school, when in doubt on what to do with a patient, treat the gut. Well, what do they, they don't understand what they're doing when they treat the gut. They're trying to treat the toxic bile problem because that is what is burning holes in your gut. That is what is leaking into your system, causing all your problems. So in that way, is your gut connected to all of your health? Yes. But is it the gut that's the problem? No, it's the toxic bile coating it and burning holes through it. That's the problem. So I'm just going to connect these real quick. Emerging roles for the intestinal microbiome in epilepsy. So let's just think about this. How does the gut microbiome affect your brain? Well, toxic bile leaking in your bloodstream would answer that, right? The gut microbiome is emerging as a key regulator of brain function and behavior and is associated with symptoms of several neurological disorders. Again, the same root cause of multiple neurological disorders. There is emerging evidence that alterations in the gut microbiota are seen in epilepsy and in response to seizure interventions. Seizure meds are changing your gut microbiome, which changes the recipe of your toxic bile, which changes the presentation of your symptoms. In this review, we highlight recent studies reporting that individuals with refractory epilepsy exhibited altered composition of the gut microbiota, the gut microbiome, the probiotics, right? We further discuss antibiotic treatment and infection as microbiome related factors that influence seizure susceptibility, how, how easily you get seizures in humans and animal models. In addition, we evaluate how the microbiome may mediate or regulate control effects of the ketogenic diet, probiotic treatment, and anti-epileptic drugs on reducing both seizure frequency and severity. I am not a ketogenic diet fan. We're going to go over that. But I want you to think a lot of people who are doing a ketogenic diet may be doing a low vitamin A diet. That may be part of what they're doing. Maybe not. But they are what creating what we call a putrefactive dysbiosis in their gut where things are just like rotting, like rotting meat and rancid fats and all of that stuff. And it may help change the bile. So, and you're also starving certain probiotics, certain bacteria in your gut. We do know that it, not eating carbs or soluble fibers will really starve the bifido, which are good and that we do want. But let's just say a ketogenic diet, a high fat, low carb diet would also starve some of the bacteria that are making secondary bile acids and then they see less epilepsy. But what happens to people who do a ketogenic diet for epilepsy when they come off the ketogenic diet? Is their epilepsy gone? Is it probably worse than it was before? Yes. Have they now painted themselves into a corner of having to stay on the ketogenic diet for good while they continue to slowly get worse underneath it? Yeah. Wow, they changed the gut microbiome with probiotics. Wow, they changed the gut microbiome with antibiotics. Wow, they changed the bile acid recipe with anti-epileptic drugs. Wow, they fed different bacteria with their diet. Does all of this affect bile? Yes. The gut microbiome and epilepsy. I'm, like I said, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I don't think the, the research doesn't, they're just kind of like, well, we know it, it impacts it. I know how it impacts stuff. Recently, evidence from both animal studies and human cases has emerged that a dysbiosis in the gut may be associated with certain forms of epilepsy. So a dysbiosis in the gut is causing a neurological problem. The ketogenic diet is an alternative treatment of drug-resistant epilepsy, although its precise mechanism of action has been unclear. It has now been shown that the ketogenic diet changes the composition and function of the gut microbiome in epilepsy patients. Studies in mice have demonstrated that the gut microbiota was necessary for the therapeutic effect of the diet. 
and mechanism of action has been proposed providing new potential strategies for treatment. They still don't talk about how changing the gut microbiome is affecting the brain. We connect the two. Through a legitimate mechanism, the gut microbiome and epilepsy. Here we go. The close relationship between epilepsy and autoimmune diseases. Wait, so the two go together like toxicity and deficiency and leaking toxic bile. That's a weird coincidence. And the fact that the cause of epilepsy is idiopathic, which means they don't know what causes it in 60% of cases suggests that intestinal microbiota may play a role in the etiology of epilepsy. I'm not sure. Interesting that they made these connections that the intestinal microbiota may play a role in the eat in the cause of epilepsy when they're saying we don't know the cause of it in 60% of cases. That's, that's quite a statement to make. We don't know the cause, but this all points in this one direction, but then they can't connect how the brain is affected by the gut. Here we go. In our study, taxonomic drift. This is like the shift in the gut microbiome. And significant differences in the intestinal microbiota of patients with epilepsy, according to healthy volunteer group, showed that autoimmune mechanisms and inflammation may have a role in the etiology of epilepsy. So again, they use the word inflammation. How good is modern medicine? So if they say inflammation is related to diseases, which now they're basically saying every disease is related to inflammation. Has that moved medicine further forward at all? No. Can you just take an anti-inflammatory medication and get rid of all your chronic diseases? Because if they're all caused by inflammation, right, couldn't you take an anti-inflammatory and fix it? Doesn't that make sense? So is inflammation is a symptom. Inflammation is a symptom. Repeat after me. Inflammation is a symptom. It's not a cause of anything. Fires happen, but something had to start the fire. There was a cause of the fire starting. The fire's burning and it's causing damage, yes, but something caused the fire to start. Something is keeping the fire going. And if you let the fire burn too long, then everything's burned to ash. So we want to fix, what if you took away the fuel from the fire? You take away oxygen, you take away what's burning. You add water, things go out, okay? Autoimmunity, if you don't know, there you go, Bojack. Yes, inflammation is a symptom. Um, <laughs> for, for those who are so ignorant as to call this a cult, we can start chanting, inflammation is a symptom. Ugh, this, this is not a cult. You want to leave anytime, you can leave anytime. I'm not going to try to keep anybody around who doesn't want to be here. <sighs> Me, so the, the, the most obvious thing of why this isn't a cult would be when I tell people you're trying to find out what helps you the most and what causes you problems. And I'm trying to teach people how to gain knowledge about their own bodies, about what helps them feel better within a certain framework, right? There's a framework to it. What makes you feel better? What makes you feel worse? Your diet within the framework may be very different from another person. Like we could have vegans in this program. They could, they, they have happened. We can have carnivores, like all muscle meat carnivores in this program. Do they do, do I think vegans would probably do better figure, you know, vegans tend to not get enough taurine, total protein and zinc, maybe B12, but that I, that eh. anyway, I'm not going to get into that here. Carnivores have a totally putrefactive gut dysbiosis and all muscle meat carnivores could do better with a little bit of psyllium fiber or sun fiber or some combination of fiber. But there might be somebody who's almost vegan. They just eat a little bit of meat. There might be a, we've had carnivores who realize that they do a lot better once they figure out the right amount and type of fiber to add. 
but could both of these people function within our program? Yes. Does that sound like a nutritional cult? Anyone who calls this a cult is horribly ignorant and point them out to me so I can just block them from everything. They're, they're not worth my time. So let's keep going. I think we already posted a link to the International League Against Epilepsy. They're against it. <laughs> I'm going to join a group that's against a disease. I because they think you're victims. We're not we create all this. We create this whether whether you were born with your health problem or whether, you know, your parents gave you a medication like Accutane or vaccines or whatever or you made choices in your life to take or do certain things, you know, that hurt your liver and made you more toxic. It doesn't, here's where you are now. You're here now. All you can do is take responsibility and say, I'm here now. It's time to fix this. And what you're saying to yourself is I am the only one who can fix it. You are not a victim of health problems. They are in you. You want to fix them. You just accept where you are and accept that it is your, only you can fix it. So microbiome research and epilepsy, hope or hype? Given, so the gut brain axis. Did I post this one? Yeah. Given the blood brain barrier. Hey, wait, before we go into this, is it possible if toxic bile can eat holes in the very liver cells that make it? Do you think? the toxic bile could eat holes in the blood brain barrier. Wait, let me go look that up. Bile, blood, brain, berry, barrier, PubMed. Let me share this. Let me see if we can. Oh, oh, I don't know. That. Oh my gosh. But the blood brain barrier keeps everything out. Wait, wait, let's, let's, Let's go over this one. Let's go over this paper that it took me two seconds to find. Two seconds. Maybe maybe five. Bile acids permeabilize. What does permeabilize mean? Does it mean it makes it able for things to pass through? To leak? Bile acids permeabilize the blood-brain barrier after bile duct ligation. Oh, wait. Bile duct ligation gives rats what? Cholestasis, toxic leaky bile in rats via RAC1 dependent mechanisms. Do I need to go further into this paper? Bile acids create a leaky blood brain barrier if bile is leaking into the blood. That's my translation of this. I guess that's a kick out of some of the Twitter, like mouth breather wannabe health gurus who are like, toxic bile theory is lacking in these areas. I'm like, no, it's not. You just didn't think of it. Now you're mad that I can explain all these things. The aim of this study. Wait, let's, let, let's, let's just read this. Here, let's read this whole thing. The blood brain barrier tightly regulates the passage of molecules into the brain, except when, and becomes leaky following obstructive cholestasis. Oh, you mean when you leak toxic bile back into the blood, the tightly regulated blood brain barrier becomes leaky. The aim of this study was to determine if increased serum bile acids, AKA cholestasis, leaking toxic bile, observed during cholestasis permeabilized the blood brain barrier. Let's go down to the conclusions. These data suggest that increased circulating serum bile acids may contribute to the increased permeability of the blood brain barrier seen during obstructive cholestasis via disruption of tight junctions. Wait. Where else do they talk about tight junctions? Oh, is that leaky gut? Oh, yeah. So bile acids are so toxic that they can eat through the liver cells that make them. It can eat through the bile ducts that are designed to carry them. It can eat through the gallbladder that's designed to hold it. It can eat through the gut. It can eat through the blood brain barrier. Pretty toxic stuff. Gosh, what if we could fix that problem? 
Now let's, so let's keep going here. Given the blood brain barrier that bile eats holes through the idea that bacteria in the gut could influence the brain was even harder to swallow because they won't admit this problem. <laughs> Leaky gut right here. Going to the brain. But an increasing number of studies are finding intimate communication between the gut and brain or toxic communication, as well as complex interplay among the gut microbiome, the brain, and the rest of the body. So how do they explain the rest of the body? How do they explain the brain connection to the gut? How do they explain the rest of the body? Sorry about that. I didn't show it. Did I share this one yet? Okay, well, let's go over stress. Okay, so you guys are talking about stress in the chat. Stress is a bile dumper. So let me, let me give an example. I was at my 30th uh, high school reunion this weekend. I was, I was very pleased with how I was doing compared to my classmates. I'll put it that way in terms of health and other things, um, which made me feel good because I didn't really like high school. But anyway, there was a woman saying, I forget what, what condition did she have? She had, it might've been seborrheic dermatitis. It might've been some other autoimmune condition. I don't remember exactly what the condition was. But she said, so does stress cause bile dumping? Yes, excessive bile dumping. So if you are a person who perceives lots of things as very stressful and you have a lots of health problems, you could be helping to create the health problems yourself. Let me go over this example. This woman said she specifically, at some point of her health problem, she decided that life was too short, as she said, to give an F about anything. So she simply stopped letting things bother her. And she said her problem, her skin problem went away. Stress will cause bile dumping. Bile will eat holes through things. Bile leaks into your bloodstream. The bile will then come out. The toxicity of it will come out through your skin, causing skin problems. So if you could reduce the stress, you're going to dump less bile. If you're not feeding that toxic gut, you know, that the bio, the gut biome, toxic bile, there's going to be, you're not going to feed those as much. There's not going to be as many bacteria there to make bad, even worse bile. So less toxic bile means you're probably going to leak less, which means you're not going to have as many problems. Now, if also you guys also know that when people are stressed, let's say they tend to eat crappier, they tend to drink more alcohol. They tend to do more. They maybe they don't exercise as much. So let's just say you stopped stressing so much and you stopped dumping so much bile and then you felt better. And then you also start eating better and drinking less alcohol and doing some more exercise. And all of a sudden the whole health problem changes. Does that mean that this, does that mean that this woman should go around and tell everybody, oh, your autoimmune condition is just stress. No, here's the biggest mistake that too many people make in health is they help their problem somehow. They've helped their problem, whether they were doing something good for themselves or whether they were doing it with a med. And then they go around on the internet or to all their friends and they say, this is the cause of your problem. You ever hear of Candida? How many people out there are just saying, Candida causes everything. What a load of horse crap. I figured that out like 15 years ago. When I got into the candida thing and then I started realizing as I went through all these things. So what did the candida thing teach me? Did candida cause everything? No. Is your gut microbiome important to your health? Yes. I went through a toxic metal phase. Everything is caused by toxic metals. Are toxic metals a problem? Yes. Do they cause everything? No. But so you can see as, as I went through the years of like vitamin D supplements. Oh my, I was doing vitamin D supplements in 2013 folks. Like I was way ahead of the curve. And were people improving like I thought they should based on all this wonderful research saying everybody's vitamin D deficient. And if you give them vitamin D, it will help them. No, I didn't see crap for results. Once in a while, I got a person who was like, I feel better. And then when I finally realized that vitamin D was a poison, 
supplemental vitamin D was a poison. I took a bunch of people off of it and I got better. I was getting better results. People were like, oh my gosh, Dr. Smith, I feel so much better now that I'm off the vitamin D. And I was like, sorry, sorry about that. So everything, all the mistakes I made in terms of thinking one thing caused everything was how I assembled the pieces of where we are now. Okay. So here we go. Let's keep going. There's a couple things I have in here. So how could your gut microbiome affect bile? Most research to date is preclinical, but results are intriguing. A, oh wait, let me, um, did I already do this? Oh, zoom. Yeah, I'll zoom Joe. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, I'm zooming my chat. Hold on. Let me zoom this. Okay. Most research to date is preclinical, but results are intriguing. A landmark study showed that the ketogenic diet alters the gut microbiome, which alters the bile, across two seizure mouse models, and that changes in the microbiota are necessary and sufficient for conferring the seizure protection of the diet. But remember, the gut microbiome will only stay changed while you're feeding it or not feeding it the same thing. Once you change the diet, it goes back and then you have the problem and the problem never went away. More specific findings included gut microbiota is altered by the ketogenic diet and required for the protection in the mouse six Hertz seizure model. That sounds EMF -y. six Hertz seizure model. Are they, I'm going to look this up. <laughs> Here we go. Gosh, EMF is not connected. You know, EMF, there's no way it's connected to disease or anything like that. The six Hertz test is a model of focal seizures that shows resistance to the number of shows resistance to a number of the current anti-seizure drugs. The seizures are induced by a low frequency, long duration, 44 milliamp current. Two times the convulsive current producing seizures in 97% of animals or 32 milliamps delivered through corneal, oh my God, electrodes. They're putting electrodes on their eyeballs. They're so nice. Wow, so nice of them. So where was I? So if they, if they, if the mice are on a ketogenic diet, then when they electrocute their eyeballs, they don't have seizures. Okay. Mice treated with antibiotics or reared germ-free are resistant to the seizure protective effects of the ketogenic diet. So they nuke the gut microbiome with antibiotics. Sorry, I didn't share this screen. They nuke the gut microbiome with antibiotics and then the ketogenic diet doesn't change the gut biome. Okay. Gut microbes modulate seizure susceptibility through mechanisms that do not involve alterations in beta hydroxybutyrate levels, a measure of ketosis. So wait, when they measure the ketosis that you're in, they're saying the gut microbiomes change the seizures, but it's not through the amount of ketosis they're in. Gosh, do you think it's bile? Hmm. Diet and micro diet dependent and microbiota dependent seizure protection is associated with elevations in bulk GABA relative to glutamate content in the hippocampus. Okay. The gut microbiome can be altered in many ways, starting even before birth. Yes. Your health problems could have started before birth. Yes. Fathers and mothers, you are handing down your toxicities and your deficiencies to your children. This is why the same things that your mother, your grandma and your grandpa and your great grandma and your great grandpa were able to eat. And people are like, but my great grandma ate this all the time and she didn't have problems. 
She handed down the toxicities and deficiencies to your grandma. Your grandma handed them down to your mother. Your mother handed them down to you. This is why you cannot use that fallacy of saying, well, my great grandma did this. It doesn't work anymore. They were less toxic and they handed down everything to you. They handed down the way you eat, the way you learned how to eat, the way you deal with stress. They handed down nature and nurture to you. At birth, delivery by cesarean section results in a different composition of gut biota compared with vaginal birth. Other factors include infant feeding, breast milk or formula, genetics, infections, diet, and medications. In addition to antibiotics, many other medications affect the gut microbiota. A survey of a thousand medications, including most anti-epileptic drugs, found that 25% of them exerted some, some effects on your gut microbiome. Many of these relationships are bi-directional. They go both ways with the gut biota affecting predisposition to infections, efficacy of medications, and even what people are predisposed to eat and how much of it they eat. And I'm, let's just, let me just, I think this is the last part. Yeah, this is the last part. Transplant studies in rats. When they're saying transplant studies in rats right here, they mean transplants of gut, of fecal transplants. So like microbiome transplants. So they're basically taking the poop from one animal and putting it into another animal's intestines. They can either do this orally or they can do it rectally. Okay. Transplant studies in rats have provided evidence that the microbiome also may help to modulate seizure susceptibility. Gut biota from chronically stressed rats were transplanted into unstressed rats who had been given antibiotics to deplete their native gut bacteria. So they had their gut bacteria nuked. And then they gave chronically stressed rat uh, probiotics, poop, pro, uh, pro, poop probiotics, basically, into unstressed rats. After treatment, all rats were subject to kindling of the amygdala to induce seizures. That sounds pleasant. Kindling of the amygdala. So they're zapping their brain. Stressed rats also received gut biota from unstressed rats. Both stressed rats and the unstressed rats with transplants from stressed rats had seizures sooner and their seizures lasted longer compared with controls. Conversely, when stressed animals received gut bacteria from unstressed animals, their seizure susceptibility decreased. The gut microbiome is making the toxic bile more toxic or less toxic. It can do either. So let's keep going. This may be a really long. Oh, wait, no, go away. Sorry, popping up windows on my thing. Let me go up to the top here. Oh, let me share the, did I share the link? Yes, I did. Oh, yes. Kelsey sent me this paper, Ketogenic Diets and Chronic Disease, Weighing the Benefits Against the Risks. Wait, go here. There we go. Conclude. Here's the conclusion. Ketogenic diets reduce seizure frequency in some individuals with drug-resistant epilepsy. It sounds like it depends on their gut microbiome, right? These diets can also reduce body weight, although not more effectively than other dietary approaches over the long term or when matched for energy intake. There is no low carb advantage. Anthony Colpo has just shredded all of this. Ketogenic diets can also lower blood glucose, although their efficacy typically wanes, decreases within the first few months. It's a temporary shift, folks. Very low carbohydrate diets are associated with marked risks. LDL-C can rise. LDL-C contains vitamin A, sometimes dramatically. Pregnant women on such diets are more likely to have a child with a neural tube defect, even when supplementing folic acid. And these diets may increase chronic disease risk. Foods and dietary components that typically increase on ketogenic diets. I'm not, I'm not going along with this. 
red meat, processed meat, saturated fat. They never separate red meat from processed meat. They never separate pork. They, they always include pork with red meat. Pork is filthy. Don't eat it. So I'm not going along with this. Our link to an increased risk of, uh, I think they're saying chronic kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, and Alzheimer's disease. Whereas intake of protective foods, of course, they're going to vegetables, fruits, legumes, whole grains. Wait, we like these. But then of course, they're going to say it's vegetables and fruits in the end and not, they're going to kind of forget about the legumes and whole grains typically decreases. Current evidence suggests that for most individuals, the risks of such diets outweigh the benefits. When you understand what the diet's doing, then you understand why it's temporary. Why they said it was a benefit in diabetes, but then the effect goes away. I would bet long-term ketogenic diets, the seizures may come back. But see, of course, they, they group all this stuff together, which I don't. And they group all of these things together, which do we, are there, are there low vitamin A vegetables that you can have? Yeah. Are there low vitamin A fruits you can have? Yeah. Beans generally good. As long as you tolerate them, whole grains, particularly either oats or barley, the highest insoluble fiber are good. But if you want to eat other ones, that's fine. Okay. See you later, John. Um, so let's, let's move on. That was the blood brain. Sorry. I'm just going through my other notes here. Oops. Wait, wait. I just closed that reopen, close tab. Okay. So let me go to the next one. Gosh, this is going to take a while. I'm only on my second. So one of the things we go into, this may be the five hour, uh, live stream. You've been, you've been wanting, um, Joe. <laughs> so let me go into this. One of the things that we talk about in this program is aldehydes. Aldehydes are toxic. Vitamin A, retinol turns into retinaldehyde. You drink alcohol, ethanol turns into acetaldehyde. If you consume methanol, which is in some foods, it turns into formaldehyde. And if you eat PUFAs, PUFAs are oxidized in your body into malondialdehyde. These things are not good for you. The enzyme in your, there's two enzymes in your body that really help you to process these aldehydes. There's aldehyde dehydrogenase. And there is aldehyde oxidase. Oh, Ramon, if you're supplementing B6, it's going to end badly. Go look up understanding B6 toxicity and have fun with that. B6 is an aldehyde. Let me do this for you. Let me see if anybody's going to explain it easily. Pyridoxal phosphate, PLP, the aldehyde group of PLP. Pyridoxine is, is an aldehyde. It does accumulate in your nerves. It will cause a neuropathy once it gets high enough. I would highly, highly suggest looking at understandingb6toxicity.com. We do not supplement it. It is, it is aldehydes slow down ALDH. They can have effects. It's not the effect you want. It's going to end. It's going to end badly. So I'm going to show some papers where they talk about pyridoxine B6 dependent epilepsy. I'm going to say that I believe the taking an aldehyde is shutting down things that is making that the epilepsy better. Cause we don't use, if you, if you watch the testimonial about seizures on the YouTube that Joe linked earlier. Um, I don't use B6. I help people with their epileptic epilepsy and seizures without ever using B6. I don't care if it's B6 dependent. It's not, it's not a B6 deficiency. B6 is causing an antidote effect. B6 actually binds to aldehydes. B6 is an aldehyde. Pyridoxal 5-phosphate, pyridoxaldehyde. That's what it stands for is an aldehyde. It does bind to aldehyde. You can look up adducts of B6. It is causing an antidote effect. It's not fixing any problem. You take a B6 person with epilepsy and you take them, if they, if the B6 helps them, you take them off B6. It never fixed a thing. So 
But what is the problem in B6 dependent, supposedly B6 pyridoxine dependent epilepsy? Let's look at this title here. Did I post this one? 3320, yeah. Consensus guidelines for the diagnosis and management of pyridoxine dependent epilepsy. What's it due to? Due to um, alpha aminoapidic semi aldehyde dehydrogenase deficiency. Aldehyde dehydrogenase. Aldehyde dehydrogenase. This breaks down or moves aldehydes through the detox pathway. So they're saying this type of epilepsy is due to a dehyde, an aldehyde dehydrogenase deficiency. Okay. Pyridoxine dependent epilepsy is an autosomal recessive condition due to a deficiency of alpha aminoapidic semialdehyde dehydrogenase. So a deficiency of aldehyde dehydrogenase. PDE ALD, this, this type of epilepsy is a developmental and epileptic encephalopathy, swelling of the brain, inflammation of the brain. Gosh, what could cause that? that was historically and empirically treated with pharmacologic doses of B6. So they're using drug doses of B6. If, they're, if you are ever using drug doses of a vitamin, you're using a drug. You're inducing a drug-like effect. It's not a vitamin effect anymore. You are overdosing on something to cause some sort of shutdown somewhere else. And how, do, how are we going to know that it's not just a B6 deficiency? Despite adequate seizure control, so the seizures got better, most patients with this were reported to have developmental de delay and intellectual disability. Gosh, we're not fixing everything. Then to improve outcome, a lysine-restricted diet and competitive inhibition of lysine transport through the use of pharmacologic doses of arginine have been recommended as an adjunct therapy. These lysine reduction therapies have resulted in improved biochemical parameters and cognitive development in many, but not all patients. Not all patients. So they're giving pharmacological doses of an amino acid. They're giving pharmacological doses of B6. When the problem is an aldehyde dehydrogenase deficiency. Okay. Let's go over other aldehyde dehydrogenase deficiencies in epilepsy. So pyridoxine responsive seizures beyond ALDH7A1. That was the same thing we were going over there. Oh, wait, did I close the, hold on. Sorry. I see it, Joe. How did I, I didn't close that. Did I, I don't remember. We should be good now. Nate was asking, and how do we increase aldehyde dehydrogenase production in the body? You don't. You stop messing it up. <laughs> you do not try to increase ALDH production. You try to, it, it'd be like saying, think of what most people are doing with ALDH in their body is it's like they're driving around with their emergency brake on. So they're trying to drive normally, but they have the emergency brake on. It's not working. If you had the emergency brake on, what most people think of doing, kind of like you were kind of alluding to, Nate, they want to put a turbocharger on the engine. The problem in the car not going as fast as you would like or not running the way you want is not because the engine needs more power. It's because you have the emergency brake on. That's what's slowing everything down. Your car is not naturally running the speed it's supposed to. So, what do we do instead of putting a turbocharger on it? Because if you put a turbocharger, on a car where the emergency brake is still on, you're just going to burn out everything in the car faster. See, we don't put the turbocharger on. We make, we take the emergency brake off toxicity and deficiency. We make sure the engine is clean. And then we make sure the engine has the parts it needs to run properly, which is the minerals and the nicotinic acid, the flush niacin and that stuff. And then the car starts running properly and you never had to put a turbocharger on it. That is how we do these things. So pyridoxine responsive seizures are characterized by early onset seizures and epileptic encephalopathy, neonates and infants, which respond to pyridoxine. So they respond to this, but they can, this is the same as saying it responds to any other medication. 
They're using drug doses. This is a drug-like effect. Any type of seizures can be the first presentation of PDRs in these children. So it could be any type of seizures. It's not just one type. Didn't I have this in here? Um, oh, a large number of children with pyridoxine responsive seizures do not have any known genetic confirmation. So wait, if they don't have the genetic deficiency in aldehyde dehydrogenase, but they probably have a deficiency in another aldehyde dehydrogenase, which could be by nutrition or toxicity and that stuff. Oh, wait, here's another aldehyde dehydrogenase deficiency. Gene expression analysis in epileptic hippocampi reveals a promoter haplotype conferring reduced aldehyde dehydrogenase 5A1 expression and responsiveness. Epileptic hippocampi, reduced aldehyde dehydrogenase 5A1. If you don't have enough aldehyde dehydrogenase, what are you going to build up, folks? Aldehydes. Re and here's another thing. I don't, I'm not going to show the research on it today, but reduced ALDH generally goes along with decreased bile production. Don't think of it. The liver's still making bile. It's slowly building up in the liver and it's going to blow out holes in the back end, like too much pressure in the pipes. So reducing it doesn't fix anything. It just, it just kicks the can down the road until everything blows up later. So let's just keep going. Let me see if I had anything else on this one. So this is just again, again, more. We have structural and biochemical consequences of pyridoxine dependent epilepsy mutations that target the aldehyde binding site of aldehyde dehydrogenase ALDH 7A1. So if you, if you couldn't, if this, if aldehyde dehydrogenase was supposed to process an aldehyde and it couldn't, the mutation affected the binding site. So do you understand that the aldehyde dehydrogenase could still work just fine, but the, it won't bind it. So they're saying if they could understand the impact, they could predict symptom severity and aid the development of patient specific medical treatments by how much aldehyde they were going to build up. So now just to prove the point, disulfiram, di two sulfur, sulfurs, two sulfurs in this med. What does disulfiram do? It's a medication that specifically slows down ALDH. Disulfiram, named after sulfur, it specifically slows down ALDH. Sulfur slows down your detox. Don't believe anybody on the internet who's like, you need sulfur to detox. You might need a little bit, but you're going to get all you need from meat. So if you're not eating meat, that may be a problem. You may have a lack of, you may have a little bit of a lack of sulfur. You do need a a bit of sulfur, but everybody's getting too much with their cruciferous vegetables, their broccoli and cabbage and Brussels sprouts and cauliflower and onions and garlic and dairy and egg whites and taking supplements like MSM, which is sulfur, methyl sulfonyl methane, taking chondroitin sulfate, glucosamine sulfate, alpha lipoic acid is full of sulfur. You do not need tons of sulfur to detox, get that out of your head. Taking a supplement of sulfur is a, a pharmaceutical medication of sulfur is how they slow down your ALDH. Gosh, I was just showing you how people with genetic deficiencies of ALDH get seizures. So what if somebody took a medication that was designed to slow down ALDH? Gosh, what happens. Are you following me? Did I not do this one yet? No, I did. What if there's more than one paper? Oh, wow. They have a whole, uh, I guess, guess they have more than just one case study here. Disulfiram induced epileptic seizures. 
We present a hospitalized 47-year-old male patient with two episodes of generalized tonic-clonic seizures during treatment with disulfiram while abstinent from alcohol. So disulfiram slows down ALDH. So the reason why they do this is, is to get alcoholics to stop drinking because if they drink, they don't break down the acetaldehyde. They build up acetaldehyde in their system, which is extra toxic. They feel hungover and terrible. So they don't want to drink, but it's actually more dangerous for them. They're, they're decreasing their ability to process alcohol and vitamin A and methanol and formaldehyde. They're, they're slowing down everything. Gosh, and what happens when you build up aldehydes? Seizures is one thing that you can happen, is one thing that could happen. Okay. And oh, I think this was, let me see. I think I found there was something in here. Let me go find it. Let me find it. Oh, I just wanted to bring this up before we go into niacin, nicotinic acid, not niacin, never niacinamide, not taking NAD, not taking NMN, not taking nicotinamide, riboside, nicotinic acid, flush niacin is all we talk about here. So the enzyme aldehyde dehydrogenase 7A1 catalyzes the final step in the lysine catabolic pathway. The NAD, this is what flush niacin Nicotinic acid helps you make the best more than anything else. Nicotinic acid, flush niacin, is the least expensive and best way to produce more NAD. You need NAD to run ALDH, which is what they just said. NADA dependent. It requires NAD to run ALDH. This was a really important development. The whole Love Your Liver program was when Kelsey... And I, we were on a podcast together and then we started talking and she finally convinced me of the difference between flush niacin, AKA nicotinic acid and all the other crap that's out on the market. The NAD dependent, so it requires NAD to oxidize alpha amino adipate semialdehyde to alpha amino adipate. It's a member of the ALDH superfamily, which is a large group of enzymes that catalyze the oxidation or detox of various aldehydes. So you need enough nicotinic acid, AKA flush niacin to run your ALDH. Think of nicotinic acid as the gasoline. So you remember we were doing the car analogy with the emergency brake on, right? One of the things you need to run the car is gas. If we're talking about the car is ALDH, you need nicotinic acid, flush niacin, whether it's from food or supplements to run the engine. Okay. You don't run the engine. You're not going anywhere. So this, we're going to get to niacin and seizures later. We have research on that. And then we'll, we'll go into that. Let's go into, okay. Let me just make sure I'm on the right one. Yeah. Okay. Wait, where, why is that popping up? So one of the things that I like to go over on the program is protein intake. If you do not have enough protein, your detox systems don't run well. Okay. If you ever hear about vitamin A deficiency, vitamin D deficiency, what these, what these supposed deficiencies in fat soluble alcohols, retinol, cholecalciferol, calcitriol. Then we got the vitamin E's, tocopherol, tocotrienol. You don't have any deficiencies in alcohols. <laughs> but all the countries where they really tend to show this, like supposed vitamin A deficiency, are places where they don't eat much meat at all. What would be the best way to get a protein deficiency? <laughs> don't eat meat. 
So let's go into malnutrition and experimental epilepsy. Did I post this one? Mothers and fathers who love your mothers. Disturbances in the intrauterine environment, so while you're pregnant, can have harmful effects on the fetus and pathological consequences persisting throughout adult, uh, adolescence and adulthood, which means that uh, somebody who grows up with this could then pass the problems down. Do you understand? Protein restriction during the prenatal period has a significant imp prenatal has a significant impact on growth and development of the central nervous system. Food restriction increases the risk of neurological disorders such as epilepsy. Ladies and men, if you have never counted your protein grams in a day before, you should. Absolutely make sure you are getting at least, at minimum. This is not, people try to interpret me as saying, all you need is 50 grams of protein a day. I'm not saying that. I'm saying at the very minimum, get at least 50, five, zero grams of protein a day. Some of you ladies out there, you're like, well, I eat meat like twice a day and you still are not getting 50 grams of protein a day because your meat serving is so small. Count it, weigh out your things for a couple days and figure out that you are getting at minimum 50 grams of protein a day. Is more probably better? Yes. Do I get more than that? Yes. Do most of the people on the Love Your Liver program get more than that? Yes. But if you're like, let's say you're you're a more mature woman who's smaller, you're like a petite senior woman, you might get 50 grams of protein a day and that's like, you're like, I'm, I'm good with that. Like that's all I can eat. Cause you're just a small woman and that's okay. Or a very small man. Like, but the 50 grams of protein, this is one of the few times I'll use the world health organization as something. They actually say that to prevent protein energy, malnutrition in third world countries, a minimum of 50 grams of protein a day is what they suggest for adults. So what I'm giving you right now, folks, especially ladies, is the minimum to prevent disease in third world countries where they don't eat meat. You have meat around. It should be easy for you to get this. But if you don't know how much you're eating, you don't know. It doesn't happen with guys too, sure. But it tends to be more common with women. Several studies in animal models or humans highlight the possible adverse effects of malnutrition at the onset of epileptic seizures. The vulnerability, immunological, biochemical, and electrolyte abnormalities, and hypoglycemia may be the factors responsible for the intensification of the epileptogenic, the creation of epilepsy process in malnourished individuals. Conclusion, malnutrition negatively changes the epileptogenic circuitry. Now, if anybody says that the vitamin A detox is a restrictive food diet, that's that's lunacy and that's just a poor understanding of like words. Like we have people getting plenty of calories and doing really, really well on the cowboy diet, which is basically beef and beans. Grant fixed all his problems on the prison diet, as he calls it, which is beef or bison and black beans and white or brown rice. We have, I've had some people, you know, fix most of their health problems on beef and buckwheat. Like, or beef and oats. Like it's humans do not require that complex of nutrition to be healthy. You've been sold the idea that we need all these mega doses of vitamins and, and the wrong minerals by the pharmaceutical industry. Merck is behind most of the B vitamin research. Just so you know, they love you. I'm sure they do. So let's go into this. So at, before we go into all the other stuff, let me remind you. So if we're looking at protein energy malnutrition, it happens in countries where they don't eat enough meat. One of the biggest deficiencies caused by not eating meat, zinc deficiency, 
overall protein deficiency, taurine deficiency. Taurine is only found in meat. I don't care what you read on the internet. I've been through the research. Taurine is only in meat. It's not in dairy. It's not in eggs. Taurine is one of the amino acids that you can conjugate or bind to bile acids to potentially make them better or worse. So if you hear me talking here and you think, oh, I'm going to go supplement taurine and it's going it, to, Dr. Smith said it might help. It might help. It might make you worse. It might make you feel worse. Binding taurine to a bile acid could make it better for your recipe. It could make it worse for your recipe. So what do you have to do? You can just try it. Does it work for everybody? No. Over time, as people get better, do they need to take taurine extra? Typically not. They get better. They don't need it. So if it helps you in the beginning, you're probably not going to need it by the end. Let's go into this. Several study. Well, let's let, what was the study? What was the paper here? Did I do this one? Yes. Malnutrition and epilepsy, a two-way relationship. A link between malnutrition and epilepsy has been suspected for many years. Several studies performed on animal models or humans highlight the possible adverse effects of malnutrition in the onset of seizures. Protein, energy, so that's this is total calories. So if you don't eat enough, I talk about this all the time. If you don't eat enough food, like slow starvation will give you health problems. So if you're not eating enough, that's a problem that you need to fix. I've never advised not eating enough. I definitely tell people to get enough protein. Electrolyte, gosh, are we going to talk about potassium and magnesium and other things that are like electrolytes? Yes. We're not going to go over sodium. Sodium is pretty easy. Get a clean salt and salt your food to taste. Clean salt means white, bright white, one ingredient, sodium chloride salt or sea salt, bright white, not gray, not pink, not red and blue specks, not unprocessed. You want refined salt. You want them to take out all the microplastics and all of the mercury and all of the cadmium and all the other crap that's in the oceans these days. Vitamin or trace element deficiencies may be involved. Conversely, several determinants of epilepsy could lead to malnutrition, food taboos, and social exclusion in developing countries, as well as some adverse effects of anti-epileptic treatments. They just throw that on at the end. Well, the drugs may mess you up too. So, so let's go here. So taurine, like I told you, taurine can change the recipe of the bile. Prevention of epileptic seizures by taurine. Gosh, so do you think in these countries where they're seeing protein energy malnutrition is causing problems and they, they what are they claiming? Oh, there's a vitamin A deficiency. But then if they give people, as we're going to go over, zinc and taurine and enough protein, especially from meat, do seizures go away in those people? <laughs> so they give these animals an injection, parenteral injection of Kyenic acid, a glutamate receptor agonist causes severe and stereotyped behavioral convulsions in mice and is used as a rodent model for human temporal lobe epilepsy. This is really important. I mean, this is going to show you taurine may or may not help. Taurine may or may not help. Isn't that what I just said? This is what I observed in real people. One of the things I get a compliment on, people will tell me, gosh, what you said in the research and you showed both sides and you said it could help in this and it might not help in this. And that's exactly how it worked for this person and this person, and this person. This is what I do. When people tell me what you said was probably going to happen, it happened. And thank you for telling me early on that something could be good or something could be bad. And I'm watching for my reactions and they tell me they did listen to their body and they did what their body suggested to them. And then they felt better or they didn't feel worse because they stopped taking something that wasn't working for them. Okay. So listen to this. We found that taurine, this is an, I believe an injection of taurine. Yeah. Had a significant anti-epileptic effect when injected 10 minutes prior to the, the toxin they gave them. Acute injection of taurine increased the onset latency. It took it longer to come on and reduced the occurrence of tonic seizures. Taurine also reduced the duration of tonic clonic convulsions. And mortality rate, death rate following the, so they, they almost, they killed some of these animals with this KA stuff, KA induced seizures. 
Furthermore, taurine significantly reduced neuronal cell death in the CA3 region of the hippocampus, the most susceptible region to KA in the limbic system. Does taurine work for everything? On the other hand, supplementation of taurine in drinking water for four continuous weeks failed to decrease the number or latency of partial or tonic clonic seizures. Gosh, it didn't help when they gave it every day by mouth. To the contrary, we found that taurine fed mice showed increased susceptibility to KA induced seizures as demonstrated by a decreased latency for clonic seizures, an increased incidence and duration of tonic clonic seizures, increased neuronal death in the CA3 region of the hippocampus and a higher post seizure mortality of the animals. Taurine could be good for you. Ramon, let me give you a suggestion over there in the chat. If, if you would like to be the health expert, you might want to start your own channel. I don't like people giving too much advice in the chat. And if you're here to learn something, be here to learn something and not just show everybody what you think you know. Okay. So. Injections of taurine right before the problem made it less. Oral taurine for four weeks before actually made things worse. Isn't that what I just said? Taurine could make things better. It could make things worse. You have to watch your response to see if it's helping or not helping. Do not just listen to any interwebs experts who say taurine is good for everything because it's not. It changes your bile recipe. If it changes your bile recipe for the better and you feel better, great. If it changes your bile acid recipe for the worse, some people say it stirs up copper. They get a lot of copper toxicity symptoms when they take taurine. Do we know what it's causing? No, we just know they feel worse. Doc, it hurts when I do this. Well, then don't do that. Gosh, how might taurine be affecting people's symptoms? Did you know that taurine can bind to vitamin A? Vitamin A aldehyde. I love how they call it this. Retinaldehyde. Retinaldehyde taurine adducts. This means they bind together. Function in photoreceptor cells. It's not functioning as anything. It's protecting you from it. So how might taurine protect somebody? It binds to some of the vitamin A. Does this mean it works for everybody? No. Did that one? Yep. Let's see. Wait, no, I got this wrong window. Here we go. So now we're going to go into a little bit about calcium and magnesium. Okay. Let me just, ex let me set this up. So we're going to go through all these minerals and vitamins. Vitamin A toxicity in the research, if you look it up, it causes hypercalcemia, excess calcium in the blood. How does it do this? It yanks calcium out of your bones. Vitamin A causes osteoporosis. The research is fairly clear on this. Vitamin D supplements. If you take too much vitamin D, what will it cause? In the literature, hypercalcemia. How is it doing this? It's pulling calcium out of your bones. Certain studies that are like four years on men four years long on men showed lower bone density with taking vitamin D supplements. They lied to you about it helping prevent osteoporosis. They lied to you. It's causing osteoporosis to get worse. Have you ever noticed how osteoporosis keeps getting worse and worse and worse? It's not getting better. They're not fixing anything. You're seeing more heart disease, which heart disease is calcification of the arteries mainly. I've shown the study before where it showed that vitamin A increased the calcification of the aortic valve. So vitamin A increases calcium in the blood over time. Vitamin D supplements increase calcium in the blood over time. And I've shown before, it's not, it's not the greatest connection, but copper toxicity also increases calcium in the blood over time. When you get too much calcium in your blood, your body cannot have too much calcium in the blood or else your brain doesn't work right and your heart doesn't work right. What two things does your body need to work right so you can keep living? Your brain and your heart. So what will your body do if calcium goes too high? It will shove it into soft tissues, your joints, tendons, ligaments, cartilage, brain, 
heart. It will actually take it out and put it into those areas to get it out of the blood. Because the blood is the magic that keeps you alive. So your body will work very, very hard to keep the blood right. And then people say, well, I've never had hypercalcemia before. I've taken all these things. Your body is working overtime to get the calcium out of the blood. Your body will choose the slow death of calcifying you into a statue because that takes a long time over the quick death of letting calcium rise too high in your blood and affecting your brain or your heart. Your body's smart. It chooses the slow death over the quick death. So if I'm saying here we have these toxicity patterns and deficiency patterns, and I'm saying high calcium tends to happen in disease and low magnesium tends to happen in disease, we have this paper here. Serum ionized magnesium and calcium levels in adult patients with seizures. What do you think we're going to find? They hypothesized that serum ionized levels of calcium and magnesium would be altered significantly during certain types of seizures. We were able to show significantly lower magnesium and higher ionized calcium to magnesium ratio. So there's too much calcium to not enough magnesium in seizure patients compared with a racially matched control group. Well, it's good that they racially matched them. Wouldn't want to come to any racist conclusions. So let's go into the next one. Vasoconstriction as the etiology or the cause of hypercalcemia, too much calcium in the blood, induced seizures. Okay, let me explain something to you. Calcium is necessary for things to contract, including your muscles. But remember that your blood vessels are tubes made of muscle. Smooth muscle. Too much calcium causes things to contract more than they should and calcify. What do you need to undo that? You need magnesium to relax muscles and to decalcify. Hmm. So what do you think we're going to find? Are we going to find high calcium in seizures and maybe magnesium deficiency? Let's just keep going. We present a 43-year-old woman who had frequent seizures that later evolved to status epilepticus with marked hypercalcemia at the time of the seizures. So if a seizure is, a, is definitely related to a bile dump and bile is going to contain vitamin A and copper and potentially any vitamin D supplements that you've taken, whether it's cod liver oil or colocalciferol or D2 or whatever, and you dump all that at once, could that cause your blood calcium to go up by stealing all the calcium out of your bones, which then goes into your blood? The sequence of events suggests the hypothesis that reversible cerebrovasoconstriction may play a role in hypercalcemia-induced seizures. Reversible, huh? Hypercalcemia, too much calcium in the blood. I see it on hair tests all the time. Can cause drowsiness. Drowsiness. I'm talking like, I must be talking like Mike Tyson with the upcoming fight, um, can cause drowsiness, lethargy, weakness, confusion. Think of brain fog and coma, but rarely causes seizures. Neuronal membrane excitability changes, hypertensive encephalopathy, high blood pressure, brain swelling, and vasoconstriction induced by hypercalcemia have all been hypothesized to be the etiologies of seizures but vasoconstriction during hypercalcemic seizures has not yet been reported. We present a patient with status epilepticus caused by breast carcinoma induced hypercalcemia. We'll go over that. Serial brain magnetic resonance imaging and cerebral angiography studies showed reversible occipital, that's the back of the head, high signal abnormalities and transient cerebral vasoconstriction. These findings suggest that vasoconstriction is a contributing factor, contributing factor, Contributing factors, not the only thing. It's one of many things like we're going over today. It's not all just one thing. It's many things. So if anybody ever tries to reduce me to like just vitamin A toxicity, you understand that they've never looked into my work and they're probably not going to. So don't waste your breath on them. Is a contributing factor to hypercalcemia related seizures? Okay, I'm sorry, but breast cancer. This is all going together. 
It's all, to, it's not the breast cancer is not like doing something. It's cancer is accumulated toxicity that your body is trying to create new areas for. Cancer is a reaction by your body to toxicity. It's making new storage areas for it because you're too toxic and all the places you used to store it in, you can't, you run out of room. So you're making new storage areas for it. And what am I telling you are toxins? Oh, like vitamin A, does vitamin A cause hypercalcemia in toxicity? Yes. Did Grant Genru, ggenru.org, did he write a whole book, free ebook? You can go to, I mean, sorry, dot blog, ggenru.blog. You can go see his ebook where he connects vitamin A toxicity to breast cancer. Vitamin A toxicity causes hypercalcemia. Are, are you putting it together yet? So. Oh, she has low back pain and osteoporosis. Wait, was I talking about vitamin A toxicity and vitamin D supplements pulling calcium out of your bones and they cause hypercalcemia? <sighs> low back pain. You ever notice stiffness with low back pain? Gosh, what do you think causes stiffness? Excess calcium in the blood that the body's putting into the muscles because it has to get it out of the blood. I like how they say right-handed. How I, I wonder how that's like correlates to any of this stuff. <laughs> I want to see if right hand, let me look for right. Focal disappearance of the occipital branch in the right posterior. So, so her blood vessel basically disappeared on the MRI. So I guess they're saying right-handed because they're seeing all this right-handed stuff. I just want to see if there was some reason why they said right-handed. I was like, I've never seen that before. Okay. So let's get into, so if calcium is a problem and magnesium is the antagonist of calcium, if calcium was a problem, in seizures, excess calcium with seizures and things that raise calcium like vitamin A, vitamin D supplements, copper, magnesium should help, should help undo that. And I have a whole video on this channel about vitamin A depleting magnesium, weird connection. Dietary intake of magnesium and the risk of epilepsy in middle-aged and older Finnish men. A 22-year 22 22-year 22 follow-up study in a general population. I want long-term. Humans, long-term. Hmm. Dietary intake of magnesium was inversely associated with risk of epilepsy. So the higher the inverse, higher magnesium intake, lower risk of epilepsy. Lower intake of magnesium, higher risk of epilepsy. Is this fitting with what we're going over already? This is the science direct one. Yes. So can magnesium supplementation reduce seizures in people with epilepsy? Nate, you're going to, for your questions about what to do, that is what the love your liver program is all about. It's 99 bucks a year, members.nutritiondetective.com. I do not have time to go over my life's work on a YouTube. And also I like to put food on my table. So that's, that's what the Love Your Liver program is for. So can magnesium supplementation reduce seizures in people with epilepsy? A hypothesis. Studies suggest that the modern Western diet and lifestyle may lead to magnesium deficiency. Oh, another thing about stress depletes magnesium. And this appears to be associated with a wide range of medical conditions. Magnesium deficiency decreases seizure thresholds in animal models of epilepsy. And indeed, low magnesium concentration in the perfusate is a common method of generating spontaneous epileptiform discharges from rat hippocampal slices. So when they have slices of rat brain and they put low magnesium in the liquid they put the brain slices in, Common method of generating spontaneous epileptiform discharges. Common method of causing epileptic seizures, epileptic activity in it. And they see magnesium deficiency 
makes it so that seizures happen at a lower threshold. E they happen easier in animal models of epilepsy. Okay. Now we get into humans. Some studies have shown that people with epilepsy have lower magnesium levels than people without epilepsy. And we just saw a higher intake in the Finnish men, higher intake of magnesium, less epileptic issues. There are case reports of seizures being controlled with magnesium supplementation in people with specific conditions. And recently in an open randomized trial, children with infantile spasms responded better to an ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone, plus magnesium than to ACTH alone. If you haven't seen my adrenal fatigue episode live stream, you should, you should watch that one too. So they're just hypothesizing that it could reduce seizures. Okay. But they already showed a bunch of evidence. <laughs> Case reports of seizures being controlled with magnesium supplementation. So if we can show, this is the best you're going to get folks about like the pharmaceutical industry, the pharma cartel, as I call them, does not want to fix these problems. So they're not going to fund research on magnesium. So what we can, the best we can do is we can find out if a condition is related to a deficiency of something. We've shown that with magnesium now. And then if you can supplement it, that it, re, if it reduces the incidence of the problem, you can be pretty sure that you're onto something. And that's what we do like every week here. Okay. Oh, no, didn't want to do that. Wrong button. There we go. Okay. Magnesium deficiency as a cause of acute intractable seizures. Intractable, not treatable. Like they're not going away. Clinical and experimental investigations have shown that magnesium depletion causes a marked irritability of the nervous system. Does any, do any of you have a marked irritability of your nervous system, do you feel like? Like you go around today, you see everybody's got a marked irritability of their nervous system, right? Eventually resulting in epileptic seizures. Although magnesium deficiency as a cause of epilepsy is uncommon because they never test for it. They don't care. It's recognition and correction may prove life saving. Does your doctor ever run a magnesium test on you? Unless you ask. Two case reports are presented, which emphasize the importance of recognizing hypomagnesium hypomagnesemia, low blood magnesium in patients with acute intractable seizures. Sounds pretty important to me. Magnesium is an effective adjunct therapy for drug resistant seizures. You, you're going to love this. This is just total pharma cartel. Like you have to do the drug drug therapy, but if the drugs don't work, then we'll give you an essential mineral then we might suggest it. But only if the toxic drugs don't work. We got to test the toxic drugs first. And they have to not work. Insanity. They want you, they, as I say, they want you sick, crazy, infertile, and dead early. And they train the doctors to help do that. The doctors may not know what they're doing, but the tools they give them are intended to do that to you and your family and your friends. It doesn't mean doctors are evil. Doctors are just trained in crap methods. Their methods suck. They think that giving the body toxins. So, so first of all, it, if you're, if you have a health issue, you're broken somehow your body's broken and they go, Oh, well, you're just broken. You're going to be broken forever. So now we're going to give you this toxin, which has the most common side effect that is the opposite of what you have. You know, what is, what is allopathic medicine, you know, conventional medicine? It's if it's hot, make it cold. If it's dry, make it wet. If it's broken, cut it out, right? That's what they do. For almost a century, magnesium has been used as a prophylaxis preventative and treatment of seizures associated with eclampsia. For almost a century. Magnesium is a CNS depressant. No, no. It helps reduce the overexcitability of it. Right? So if you were like 
overexcited and somebody gives you something like magnesium and it calms you back down to normal, is that a depressant? No. It's bringing you back to normal. <laughs> you need magnesium to live. They're trying to turn magnesium into a drug. So a CNS depressant with numerous functions intracellularly in the cell and extracellularly. However, because of the availability of, however, because of the availability of well-studied anticonvulsant drugs, magnesium has not been tested widely in the treatment of epileptic seizures. Gosh, do you wonder why? Oral magnesium supplementation. This is, okay, I want you to understand. If you haven't watched my topical magnesium video, live stream, you should watch it. I consider topical or transdermal magnesium, like the magnesium lotion I make. And there's other ones I go, it's like a three hour live stream on magnesium. Watch it. I talk about the magnesium lotion I make. I talk about all the other approaches that I've used and, and give guidelines on it. Okay. I consider topical or transdermal magnesium to be my estimate is 10 times as effective as pills. So I want you to see what happened in this study where they gave or they gave pills of magnesium and they gave about the, sh the crappiest formula, crappiest form, they gave magnesium oxide. The crappiest form of magnesium they could give them and they still saw benefits. And I'm here saying that topical or transdermal magnesium, magnesium you absorb through your skin is in my professional opinion, 10 times as effective as pills. Let's go. Oral magnesium supplementation was associated with a significant decrease in the number of seizure days per month from 15.3. I'm not, not going to read the plus or minus from 15.3 to 10.2 at the first follow-up three to six months. So in three to six months of taking crappy magnesium, they reduced on average the number of seizure days per month by five days, by 33% in three to six months and to 7.8 seizure days per month. That second follow-up six to 12 months, they reduced it by 50% basically 50% with crappy pills of magnesium. 36% of people, one third of people had a response rate of 75% or greater at second follow-up. Two patients reported seizure freedom. No more seizures. How many people were in this? 20, 22 people. Basically 10% of the people had no more seizures after taking it for up to a year has you, if, if you are out there having epilepsy or seizures, has your doctor ever, has your neurologist or whatever ever mentioned magnesium? Probably not. Most patients were well-maintained on mag oxide, magnesium oxide, 420 milligrams twice a day. So 840 milligrams of magnesium oxide. That's not how much magnesium is in it. That's total magnesium oxide. So all the magnesiums plus all the oxygens, 420 milligrams twice a day. So I don't know how much magnesium is in that. Or in two cases, magnesium lactate without significant adverse effects. With So pay attention there. Without significant adverse effects, the most frequent being diarrhea, four out of 22 people. So here's a tip. Somebody in the, somebody in the chat can help answer this. Um, if you're taking oral magnesium and you get diarrhea, how do you fix it? Doc, it hurts when I do this. Then don't do that. So how do you fix diarrhea from magnesium pills? Somebody give me the answer in the chat and I'll give you a gold star. Come on, you guys are fashion. This it only takes two words or something. Take less. Okay. Take less. No, yeah, you go. Okay, Nate, your answer is legit. You could use it topically. Topical magnesium, except in the most rare of cases, will not ever cause loose bowels. 
oral magnesium because it's in your gut. The way you know you're taking too much oral magnesium is you get loose bowels, and so you back off. It's very straightforward. Yeah, as Will said, you take more magnesium. Yes, you just blow it out. You just got to... Okay, the idea of blowing things out, like you can go and rev a car and kind of blow out the carbon or whatever. Your body doesn't work that way. If something makes you feel bad, generally take less or stop taking it. Don't try to blow it out. Or if your practitioner says, oh, just keep taking it, it'll get better. No, it won't. So the discussion, these results suggest that oral magnesium supplementation may prove to be a worthwhile adjunctive medication in treating drug intractable epilepsy. So they used their drugs on it. It didn't work. And then they gave cheap and easy to get and terrible form magnesium. And they got 10% of people, two out of 22, had no more seizures. 36%, so that's that's what, one third of 22. So that's like seven people, maybe eight. Eight people had 75% less seizures in six to 12 months time. Eight people had 75% less seizures. Two people had no seizures. So 10 of the 22 people And does, do neurologists talk about magnesium as the first line with people? No. No, they don't. So, oh, this was just, I got some links from here. Um, let me do, I just want to show this. This is, this is so delusional. Oh, I keep hitting that button. What was I doing? This, let me copy this and we'll go over here, paste this. Okay. Let's, wait, I just want to go over this. It, if, if you wish to take magnesium supplementation to help with your epilepsy, it is recommended to speak with your GP as magnesium may interfere with your current medications. It is also important to keep your magne daily magnesium supplement consumption to 350 milligrams per day. They don't say elemental. They don't say anything. How much do GPs, M MD, general practitioners know about nutrition generally, folks? Hardly anything. How, how does an essential mineral, an essential, keyword there, essential mineral interfere with a medication do you need the medication to to live do you need pharmaceutical toxins in your body to live no do you need magnesium yes has magnesium deficiency been shown to correlate with seizures yes has magnesium supplementation been shown to help seizures yes if you are ever taking an essential nutrient in normal doses and it inter interacts like, like we, we use six minerals and niacin, flush niacin in our stuff. Sodium, magnesium, potassium, zinc, selenium, molybdenum, and flush niacin. If any of those interact negatively with a medication, it's because the medication is the problem. It's not the essential nutrients that you need to survive. <sighs> The problem's the poison that you're putting in. It's not the essential mineral. Okay, so let's keep going. Okay, we're going to hit on the copper lovers again. Copper is a toxic metal. You cannot avoid it completely. It's going to be in foods, especially if you're eating plant foods. You can't avoid it completely. Copper is a real problem. Let's go over how it's a problem. If you're out in there, if you're out in some group, like, I don't know, a group, a protocol group or a revolution group or some other group that is pushing copper cups or copper clothing or, 
I don't know. What, are, are they doing copper butt plugs now? I mean, they might. They love it so much. <laughs> I supplement my copper rectally. Um, anyway, they would probably do it. They'd probably put copper water in an enema and shove it up there. The impact of serum copper, blood copper on the risk of epilepsy, a Mendelian randomization study. Results that I can't highlight on this page for whatever reason. The IVW method revealed that serum copper was associated with increased risk of generalized epilepsy. And the sensitivity analysis further supports the robustness of the results. So more copper, more epilepsy. More copper, more generalized epilepsy. The current study reveals a possible causal, cause, the cause of, the root cause of, Serum copper in increasing the risk of generalized epilepsy, which provide guidance for identifying potential risk factors for epilepsy. Copper increases calcium. Didn't we show that connection? You need zinc and selenium and molybdenum to lower copper in the body. Oh, guess what I'm going to show deficiencies for in epilepsy. You need zinc to detox vitamin A. I'm going to tell you that vitamin A will increase copper in the system. It's all connected. It's all connected. But wait, there's more. Concentration of copper and ceruloplasma and serum of patients treated for epilepsy. For those of you who may have come from the protocol world, ceruloplasmin is made by your liver to bind to copper to protect you from it. It's not delivering it. It's protecting you from this toxic metal called copper. So does it make sense that as copper goes up in the system, ceruloplasmin will go up with it? Does it make sense that if your liver can't make ceruloplasmin fast enough or well enough that you cannot protect yourself from free copper and free copper is the worst copper that can be around? I've been over the paper before, what we call the chicken study, where as they put chickens on a low vitamin A diet, their ceruloplasmin went up. Whereas the protocol people say you need vitamin A to make ceruloplasmin based on some crappy little cell studies. We actually looked at chickens live and a low vitamin A diet increased their ceruloplasmin. We don't look at cell studies very much. Cell studies are not helpful. In 54 epileptic patients, 28 females and 26 males, age 21 to 48, serum copper, blood copper, and ceruloplasmin, CRL, concentrations were assessed. Comparing with control group, as in non-epileptic, the mean serum co copper and ceruloplasmin concentrations were significantly increased. More copper in people. Let's do more. Copper takes longer to detox than vitamin A. So if you're out there going, well, maybe vitamin A is bad for me, but copper's still good. We still need copper. You're, you're in it for a long time. Copper is the hardest one to get rid of. Assessment of copper status in epileptic patients treated with anticonvulsant drugs by measuring the specific oxidase activity of ceruloplasma. I want you to pay attention to this. Significant increases in serum levels and decreases in hair copper levels have been previously described in epileptic patients treated with anticonvulsant drugs. Why do we test both hair and blood copper? Because they don't always match. But if you find copper toxicity on either one, you have copper toxicity. That's all you need to know. Sometimes it shows up in the hair and not in the blood so much. Sometimes it shows up in the blood and not the hair so much. But if you got it in one place, you got it. We also test zinc in hair and in blood. Now I looked for this blood test. I tried to find this blood test in 11 patients with a beta globulin migrating GGT isoform. So this is a specific, they broke down GGT and they found this one type of GGT. So GGT is normally a liver enzyme by itself. 
but they started breaking down GGT into various what they call isoforms. GGT3, and they're saying it is a sensitive marker of cholestasis or toxic leaky bile. I immediately contacted Julie, my practice manager, to contact LabCorp to say, can we get GGT3? Can we do this? Do they have it? And they said no. So, of course, they don't want you to find out about this. The levels of ceruloplasmin, oxidase activity, and total GGT activity were significantly higher than in the group of 79 patients without the GGT3 isoform. Consequently, in some cases, a drug-induced cholestasis, oh my gosh, pharma cartel toxins causing you to leak toxic bile into your system, which contains copper, may also contribute to the increase of serum copper and ceruloplasmin. Makes sense, right? The values obtained for the specific oxidase activity of ceruloplasmin suggest that in the most of the cases, chronic administration of phenobarbital, phenytoin, carbamazepine, or valproic acid does not produce marginal or even moderate copper deficiency. So I want you to see up here at the top, they were trying to suggest that it would mask a copper deficiency produced by drug-increased biliary copper excretion. So they were saying that, oh no, your liver's going to put too much copper into your bile. And then you're going to get a copper deficiency. You go get copper deficiency. It's going to be really bad. Um, No, they have high copper. And that even their hypothesis of taking these epileptic meds doesn't cause copper deficiency at all. Okay. Copper's a problem in epilepsy. Let's go into, was that it? Yep, let's go here. So now, I want to go into vitamin A and epilepsy. First thing I'm going to say, vitamin A depletion diets. Okay, in the early days, let me let me let me go back to the early days because Grant and I, Grant and I, ran into people who were doing this. So first of all, folks, you cannot go on a zero vitamin A or a zero copper diet. It is impossible. Even if you ate only red meat, red meat still contains some copper. Red meat still contains some vitamin A. I don't care what the food databases say; it contains vitamin A. Some, and I'll put it this way: an all red meat diet is probably the lowest vitamin A and copper diet you could go on. But it has its own problems if that's all you eat because then you create a putrefactive dysbiosis and then you get the problems are going to show up down the line. A an all muscle meat carnivore diet with with some real soluble fiber is a legit detox diet. Most people don't want to eat that though. I don't want to eat all red meat for the rest of my life and then take like psyllium fiber in a drink. That's just not I'm not going to do it. But what I'm getting at is in the early days of the low vitamin A diet stuff, there was some geniuses, and I'm saying that some real geniuses, I hope you can hear the sarcasm, who thought, I'm going to go on a zero vitamin A diet. And so they were eating, they were pulling some of the, um, some of the Ray Pete stuff or whatever you want to call it. They were eating white sugar. They were eating white flour. And they were probably doing some sort of fat. They basically tried to get a zero vitamin A diet. And they caused themselves problems and they're complaining on forums like, I don't feel good on this. I'm on a zero vitamin. Does anybody actually think that eating white sugar and white flour and maybe MCT oil is a legit human diet? I don't. So could you do horribly stupid things to get to a low vitamin A diet? Yes. Does that mean it's going to be good for you in every way? Now, could it be low, as you're going to see in this paper, could it be low vitamin A and help certain issues? Yes. Could it also be deficient in other ways that causes problems? Yes. So could you create one problem while solving another? Yes. So when you see this, remember this. 
So I want you to look at what this guy, Ivan M. Sharman, he does another study after this. An unusual case of self-imposed vitamin A deficiency. I'm going to read most of this left side. It must be a rare, rare event for a case of vitamin A deficiency. Wait, wait, wait. When was this? 1969. And they're going to say it must be a rare case to find vitamin A deficiency. A rare case. And everybody, everybody on Twitter's like, you need more vitamin A. When in 1969, they're like, deficiency is rare. The U.S. stopped requiring vitamin A um, labeling on foods because deficiency is so rare. Deficient vitamin A deficiency, they're even saying it's not happening anymore. So what does that leave us? If deficiency is not real, that only really leaves toxicity, doesn't it? Hmm. And what am I here talking about all the time? Okay. It must be a rare event for a case of vitamin A deficiency to occur today in the United Kingdom. A young man age 20, I, I don't think I can highlight this or the highlighting looks really weird. A young man age 20 who had been suffering from epileptic fits from the age of 12 read an article in 1963 in the New Scientist entitled, quote, What Too Much Vitamin A Does to Cells. Probably not a bad paper. The article describing some of the work of Dame Honor Fell, director of the Strange Ways Laboratory, Cambridge, mentioned the influence of vitamin A on membrane permeability. You mean like retinoic acid causing chemical peeling, dissolving layers of skin cells? Called a yellow peel? Okay. It is not clear how he did, but so, but the patient deduced from this article that vitamin A was responsible for his epileptic condition and he resolved to cut out all sources of the vitamin from his diet. Do you see the mistake coming? He resolved to cut out all sources of the vitamin from his diet. After reading books on food composition, he deliberately set out to remove all foods containing either carotenoids or vitamin A from, the, from his diet. Since his attempt to eliminate the vitamin from his diet, he has had only one grand mal fit. Only one. And he is convinced that his dietary experiment has been successful in ameliorating or making his condition better. There is no doubt that he has withdrawn all but traces of vitamin A from his diet and his blood levels are the lowest ever recorded in Great Britain. Table one. We'll go over that. The low values for both carotenoids and retinol may be compared with those for normal subjects found by Leitner, Moore, and Sharman in 1960. Okay, before I read the rest of this, I have shown in my vitamin A deficiency doesn't exist thread and video here, all the things that they say vitamin A deficiency can, is, can cause, like eye problems, vision problems can all also be caused by a zinc deficiency, a protein deficiency, or a taurine deficiency. This It doesn't say what this guy's diet is, but what if he took out all meat? Could he get a zinc deficiency? Could he get a protein deficiency? Could he get a taurine deficiency? Do all of those affect the eyes negatively? Yes. Do all of those cause, can any one of those cause the same eye symptoms that supposed vitamin A deficiency causes? Yes. Did I tell you that red meat contains vitamin A and copper? Yes. What if this gentleman cut all that out? What could happen? Well, let's see. The sad sequel to this case is that not unexpectedly, the patient is now losing his sight. Colored photographs were made of the patient's eyes. In the first of these taken in April 1968, white dots were apparent showing changes in the corneal epithelium. Blah, 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 blah. Okay. This guy was eating a crap diet, but it was low in vitamin A. This guy didn't have very much vitamin A to start with. Oh, 52. Oh, wait. No, the controls. Yeah, yeah. So this is what he got down to. So the controls were at like, this is a lot of vitamin A. This is 52 is a lot. So anyway, the lowest ever recorded in Great Britain. I'm sure Grant's lower than this. We got people lower. Okay, so here's the thing, folks. If you want to believe that it was vitamin A deficiency that got him, that's fine. We have people lower than this guy with no eye problems. 
We have people lower than this guy with zero eye problems. Their eyesight's getting better. So what does that tell you? Was it vitamin A or did the guy just make a crappy diet? And the weird thing is, is they don't tell us what he was eating. Are they hiding that? The patient is aware of the danger of going blind if he continues his present dietary regimen, but prefers to risk this rather than as he believes chance a return of his fits. This guy's going to choose potentially going blind over his seizures. His diet sucks. I could fix, he could probably eat some meat and within a week, his eyesight would be so much better, but who knows what happened to him. Now let's go into the next one. So this paper doesn't have an abstract like this paper. It's weird that I can't find this paper. You'll see in a second. Vitamin A and epilepsy, a dietary contra contra temps. I'm going to say contra temps. If somebody knows French and it's like contra temps or something, I don't know. Contra temps. You know, I let my, <laughs> my over exaggerated French accent, um, attempt, I should say. So we can't find that. You can't find this paper anywhere, but I found somebody who summarized it in another paper. Okay. In order to investigate it further, a possible connection between vitamin A and epilepsy, Charman then studied eight epileptic patients given a vitamin A depleted diet for two years. Two years. No cases of night blindness were observed. When their plasma retinol level, their blood vitamin A level had reached 230 IUs per liter. I don't know what this translates to. They were given a vitamin A supplement. Had to save them from low vitamin A, even though no cases of night blindness were observed. What are they saving them from? They still gave them a vitamin A supplement. They wouldn't. Although pat the patients reported fewer fits during the depletion period, there was no increase in the fits during repletion. The author called his diet, his experiment, a dietary contratemps. I'm sorry. What's the definition of contratemps? An inopportune or embarrassing occurrence or situation, an unforeseen event that disrupts the normal course of things. So what was Charmin trying to prove? That these people on a low vitamin A diet were going to have problems and or get more seizures. He was trying to prove that vitamin A was necessary. What did he prove? They had less seizures as they ate less vitamin A and no cases of night blindness were observed. That's why they called it a dietary contratemps. So now do some of the, Oh, did I not share this one? Oh, sorry. So I'll get to the, uh, super chats in a bit. Sorry if I didn't share this. This is, I, um, y'all can take a picture of this. I'm not going to share the, I think this, this, uh, slideshow is linked on the vitamin A deficiency doesn't exist video on this channel. So now valproic acid is used to treat seizures. Does it affect vitamin A metabolism in the body? Valproic acid downregulates retinoic bind, retinol binding protein four. This, okay, retinol binding protein four made by your liver, made to bind to retinol to protect you from it. It's not to deliver it to the tissues. It's to protect you from free retinol because free retinol is terrible. Free copper is terrible. So your body makes proteins to bind to these things to protect you. It's not a little deliver, cute delivery system. So by vi valproic acid down regulates RBP4, which protects you from vitamin A. Oh, and then it elicits or causes hypervitaminosis A teratogenesis, vitamin, excess vitamin A or vitamin A toxicity induced birth defects. A kinetic analysis on retinol slash retinoic acid homeostatic system. Another thing, whenever you're talking about a toxin and they use the word homeostasis, they're lying to you and they're trying to hide that it's a poison. 
or if you ever see the word signaling, which I think may show up here. Valproic acid is an anti-epileptic and anti-migraine prophylactic drug. Wait, I did a whole episode live stream on migraines being caused by vitamin A. Weird. Valproic acid exhibits two severe side effects, namely acute liver toxicity and teratogenicity birth defects. Can you use a toxin to reduce the symptoms of one thing while causing the symptoms of another thing? Yes. This is the first report showing that valproic acid downregulates retinol binding protein 4. Our finding has not only has led to a possible mechanism of valproic acid teratogenesis causing birth defects, but has also initiated new preventive strategies for avoiding valproic acid teratogenesis. How about if you just don't take it? <laughs> How about if we fix the underlying cause? So, did I send this one? I think I did. Journal plus one, yeah. So let's go into this. So now one of our favorite things here, zinc. Going to have to jump in this one. The important role of zinc in neurological diseases. So let me just emphasize here. Zinc deficiency goes along with neurological diseases. You look at almost all the neurological diseases and you see excess copper. And often you see excess manganese. Zinc is an antagonist to both copper and manganese. What a weird coinky dink. The important role of zinc in neurological diseases. Well, let's go, let's go see how important it is. Epilepsy. Epilepsy is a common neurological disorder characterized by chronic brain seizures caused primarily by abnormal, excessive, or synchronized neuronal activity. More than 60 million people worldwide suffer from epilepsy, which can be brought on by a variety of factors, such as genetics, abnormal brain development, medications, and head trauma. According to epilepsy research data, zinc's neuroprotective, protecting the nervous system, including the brain, and neurotoxic effects appear to be dose dependent. Hey, do we ever talk here about not taking too much zinc? Yes. Do we test zinc in hair and blood so we can get the doses right? Yes. Do we ask people to watch their symptoms as they go up in their zinc dose when we're, they're working with me or Nathan or eventually Hope and Kelsey to, if they don't feel good on a certain zinc dose to go back down? Yes. If somebody's like, how much zinc should I take per day? I'm, I don't, I don't answer that question. We don't do that. We test, we don't guess. And then we address people test it out to see what feels good or okay, or they don't feel anything bad and they stop and they reduce if they get to symptoms. If your doctor doesn't let you adjust your doses based on how you feel on it, and they're just like, no, 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 you need 50 milligrams of zinc a day. Um, walk out of their office and don't go back. And it can have both pro and anti-convulsant effects. Well, wait, so what if I were to tell you that zinc can cause an excess amount of copper and or vitamin A to be dumped out of the liver into the bile, you leak that into the blood, and what have we seen goes along with seizures too much in the blood? Copper and vitamin A. Are you, this is how zinc could, could potentially cause problems, but also solve them, and this is why you want to find out the right dose. Postnatal day 27. So these are 27, I'm guessing 27 year old, 20, 27 day year old rats. Postnatal day 27 male Sprague Dolly rats pre treatment with a zinc deficient diet for four weeks had long term adverse effects of seizures, zinc deficiency causing seizures. In contrast, zinc supplementation for four weeks significantly mitigated or reduced the severity intensity of pilocarpine-induced limbic seizures 
and prolonged the time it took for forelimb contracture to occur. High zinc dietary treatment improved cognitive impairment, so reduced cognitive impairment, and reduced regenerative sprouting of hippocampal mossy fibers. And this is an interesting thing. In addition, zinc chelation reduced the frequency of EEG spikes and the duration of both behavioral seizures and electrical after discharges. There is no chelator that only grabs onto one thing. There is no chelator that only grabs onto one thing. So if they say zinc chelation is grabbing onto all sorts of things, copper and zinc tend to be grabbed onto by the same things. So are they potentially saying that they may have been chelating copper? And just because you there might find too much zinc in one area doesn't mean that there's not an overall deficiency, okay? When you see the evidence lining up for zinc, I mean, we've already seen serum zinc is low and serum copper is high. In addition, zinc chelation reduced the frequency of, oh, I said all this, while this does not alter the severity, while this did not alter the severity, it didn't change the severity, it didn't make anything worse, it does suggest that zinc may play a facilitative role in the onset of epilepsy. I'm going to say, I think they, they had other factors going on. Treatment with zinc with cyclo, I believe this is histidine and proline enhances vesicular zinc levels as well as hippocampus neurogenesis regenerating. You remember how many times we've heard hippocampal in all this hippocampal neuro regenerating in rats. So it raised zinc levels and it helped regenerate nerves. According to a case control study, children with intractable epilepsy had a considerably lower blood zinc levels than healthy children. One possible explanation for that is that the low zinc levels increase oxidative stress. Don't worry about that. And the incidence of seizures since zinc is a component of glutathione peroxidase and superoxide dismutase. They got one little thing in there about zinc chelation. Lots of stuff on zinc deficiency. Okay, let's keep adding to it. The copper lovers love to crap on zinc. They're like, don't ever take zinc. Ah. Long term, long term. Hmm. Long term, I like that. Long term effects of zinc deficiency and zinc supplementation on developmental seizure induced brain damage and the underlying blah, 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 and MBP expression in the hippocampus. You guys can, you know, I'm not going to say all those every time. Where was it? Here we go. Zinc deficient diet for four weeks aggravated the long-term adverse effects of developmental seizures. So it made it worse, evidenced by weight, cognition, seizure threshold, and serum zinc concentrations which were paralleled by expression changes in hippocampal GPR39 and ZNT3. In contrast, zinc supplementation for four weeks significantly improved damage-related changes described above and rescued, rescued the abnormal expression of GPR39, ZNT3, and MBP in the hippocampus. Wait, so zinc deficiency caused a bunch of problems related to seizures and repleting the zinc helped fix all those things. Hmm. Let me just make sure I got this. Yep. Did I post that one? Yep. Oh, I think I went over this one. Yeah, I think I did. Serum levels of zinc and copper. And this is one basically just saying that. Yeah. Serum copper levels in these patients are significantly higher than in healthy people. Serum zinc levels in epileptic children under drug treatment are lower compared with healthy children. No significant difference in the levels of serum copper and zinc were, was observed in using one drug or multiple drugs in the treatment of epileptic patients. Gosh, maybe because the high copper and the low zinc is something that's normal for epileptics. Yeah, we didn't have this one. So let me paste this one there. Let's keep going. We are not done yet. Okay. 
What is another mineral that we like? That is also a copper antagonist. So zinc is a copper antagonist. Selenium is a copper antagonist. We like selenium. Selenium deficiency, triggering intractable seizures. I just, you know what? I'm going to go over this. I just want everybody to have a definite, since we've seen this word a bunch of times. Intractable, difficult to manage, deal with, or change to an acceptable condition. Difficult to alleviate, reduce, remedy, or cure. Difficult. Oh, I just, sorry, Joe, I'm getting it. Don't worry. And then let me get on the selenium one. There we go. And we'll show this. Okay, got it. So selenium deficiency, triggering intractable seizures. Two children with severe neurodevelopmental retardation and elevated liver function tests developed intractable seizures during the first year of life. Detectable neurometabolic conditions have been ruled out. So they couldn't find any problems. Oh, one thing I didn't say was one of the reasons for this subject today was actually a, a guy in my gym. His name just happened to be Garrett. So I, I like him automatically, right? Um, he was telling me, you know, he, he, he was working out, I was working out and we were talking and he starts going, yeah, it's seizure. You know, he's mentioning seizures and he's like, and the doctors can't find anything wrong with me. And we're going to go reevaluate the meds and all this stuff. And I'm like, I can tell you what causes seizures. But you know what I'll do is I, I, I'm, I, I was like, I'll do this whole live stream on it. I'll do my next live stream on it. He's like, cool. Let me, let me see it when you're done. So this is, you know, all of you out there who may be dealing with epilepsy and seizures. Yes, this is dedicated to all of you. And you can thank Garrett at my gym for the topic. Okay. Or the idea to do it now. At the time of seizures, evidence for systemic selenium deficiency could be documented. Why don't they tell you what these things are? But they're talking about severe selenium deficiency. The youngest patient who manifested intractable fits from the fourth day of life died at the age of 10 months. So even though they give him some selenium, this kid still had major problems. It's probably not just a deficiency of one mineral, okay? Neuropathologic examination was consistent with progressive neuronal degeneration of childhood, PNDC, with liver disease, or formerly known as Alpers disease. And the oldest child whose diet was normally balanced, whatever, the, whatever that means, fits started from the age of 11 months and features of long-standing selenium deficiency became apparent from the age of one and a half years, so that's 18 months, and consisted of liver function disturbances, depigmented hair, white hair, I'm guessing they're saying, and osteoarthropathy, joint pains, multiple joint pains. Oral substitution with selenium supplements in both children resulted in reduction of seizures and improvement of the EEG recordings after two weeks while liver function became normal. Two of the selenodependent enzymes, glutathione peroxidase and phospholipid hydroperoxide glutathione peroxidase, PHGPX, are speculated to play a key role in the defense of neuronal cells against oxygen radical formation and peroxidative processes. Our findings support the hypothesis the presence of selenium depletion in the brain amongst patients with epilepsy constitutes an important triggering factor for the origin of intractable seizures and subsequent neuronal damage. Let me, one of the minerals that you need to run a detox enzyme called aldehyde dehydrogenase is selenium. What a weird coincidence. It's not the only case study out there. Selenium and intractable epilepsy. Is there any connection? Correlation. Sorry, I, I didn't read that. I wasn't looking at it. 80 patients who met the criteria of intractable epilepsy were compared with a normal control group of the same age, socioeconomic level, and place of living. Serum selenium level was measured with an atomic absorption spectrophotometer. The mean of serum selenium was 68.88. So let's just say 69 and 86 in the patient and control groups, respectively. 69 in the epileptics, 86 in the control group. That's that's a pretty big difference, isn't it? You don't need to be like a researcher to see that that's, that's pretty, pretty big. 
independent sample t test with p less than 0 0.5 0 0.05 indicated a significant lower mean of serum selenium in the patient group compared with that of the normal control group measurement of serum selenium in patients with intractable epilepsy should be considered as your doctor ever tested you for selenium i don't i don't need the answer to that i know what the answer is serum selenium and selenoprotein function in brain disorders This kind of says it all, doesn't it? Selenium deficiency increases risk of seizures and epilepsy, whereas supplementation may help to alleviate seizures. Seems like enough to me. So moving on. Molybdenum. Some of you may have trouble with saying it. <laughs> Here's the word. Some of you will say, I've never heard of this before. Molybdenum is an absolute critical mineral for your detox systems, for your liver. It used to be so considered so critical in soil science, garden science, growing plant science, that they would measure the molybdenum and then calibrate everything else to the amount of molybdenum in the soil. So they made the molybdenum the most important foundational factor in soil science, and then they measured everything else to it. They don't do that anymore. How nutritious is the food these days? Oh, it sucks, you say. Hmm, weird that they stopped calibrating everything to the molybdenum level in soil. So ways that I pronounce it. So if you don't want to say molybdenum, just think of it as molyb, molyb, and then denum, or think of like denim molybdenum or you can call it molly yeah i don't mean the other molly i mean molly or you can call it molly b okay i didn't do this link yet did i so there was a very important point i wanted to go over in this paper molybdenum a scoping review for nordic nutrition recommendations 2023 So before I go into all these things where it's saying molybdenum cofactor deficiency, because we're going to have a lot of papers connecting molybdenum cofactor deficiency with seizures, all these, you know, these up here, well, we don't need this one. These are all molybdenum cofactor deficiencies connected with epilepsy. But what do you need to make molybdenum cofactor? Molybdenum is an essential element in the form, form or formation of the molybdenum cofactor. <sighs> wow. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. You need molybdenum to make molybdenum cofactor? So when they find molybdenum cofactor deficiency and they say this is a genetic condition, well, what would be the most important thing for a person who has trouble making molybdenum cofactor to have in their system? So you could make sure that they could make it at all. Oh, molybdenum? Am I finding that just about everybody's deficient in molybdenum these days? Yeah. What is molybdenum connected to in the detox system? Hmm. In humans, MOCO is required for four enzymes, xanthine oxidase. This is necessary to break down caffeine if you're still drinking it. This is necessary to break down purines like uric acid, you know, in the, in the gout, I'll just say it's in the, in the disease condition of gout, you want your xanthine oxidase to run well, to break down the uric acid. Okay. It's necessary for aldehyde oxidase. Well, I'll tell you that molybdenum is also necessary for aldehyde dehydrogenase. So if you don't have enough molybdenum, you can't run the detox enzymes for aldehyde, for aldehydes. So you would build up aldehydes. Wait, selenium is necessary for ALDH and molybdenum is necessary for ALDH. Those are the parts of the engine. You need nicotinic acid or flush niacin as the gasoline to run aldehyde dehydrogenase. And all three of these things seem to correlate with seizures. Aldehydes, selenium deficiency, molybdenum deficiency, as we're going to go over, and 
nicotinic acid deficiency, which creates an NAD deficiency. Sulfite oxidase. Wow, you need molybdenum to detox sulfur. Wait, you need molybdenum to run ALDH. Molybdenum is necessary to for sulfite oxidase, which helps break down or detox sulfurs. And I tell you, sulfur slows down ALDH. Are you putting it together yet? Sulfur is not your friend. Sulfur smells terrible. There's a reason why you think sulfur smells terrible. There's a reason why in the Bible, sulfur, you know, uh, fire and uh, the brimstone. Brimstone is the sulfur smell. It's associated with the devil and hell. Sulfur is not your friend. Stop believing people who tell you that garlic's good for you. It's not. And mitochondrial amidoxime reducing component, MARC. I'm not familiar with that. So, so here we go. The enzymes are involved in the oxidation of purines to uric acid. So that's the gout connection. Metabolism of aromatic aldehydes and heterocyclic compounds. That's ALDH or aldehyde oxidase. And in the catabolism, the breakdown of sulfur amino acids. Molybdenum cofactor deficiency is a rare autosomal recessive syndrome due to a defective synthesis of MOCO, resulting in a deficiency of all the molybdo enzymes. Well, if you, if you didn't have enough molybdenum, you wouldn't make molybdenum cofactor. And if you didn't make molybdenum cofactor, you can't make all the molybdo enzymes that we just talked about. Does that make sense? Like you need the mineral. Oh, and this is what, there are no reports on clinical signs of dietary molybdenum deficiency in otherwise healthy humans. No, there's just molybdenum cofactor deficiency. Water-soluble molybdate is effic efficiently absorbed from the digestive tract, probably because the body's hungry for it. The hungrier your body is for something, the more it absorbs it. The body retention is regulated by urinary excretion. Plasma molybdenum reflects long-term intake no, it doesn't. And 24 hour urinary excretion is related to recent intake. There are no biochemical mark. Wait, 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 wait. Let's put these together. Tell me how stupid this sounds. There are no reports on clinical signs of dietary molybdenum deficiency in otherwise healthy humans. Okay. So, so we don't know how to recognize dietary molybdenum deficiency in humans. Wait, we know that it helps process aldehydes. So let's just say if somebody was really sensitive to alcohol, like the Asian flush, when we know that 50% of the Asian population is genetically slow in ALDH, and when they drink alcohol, they there's that Asian flush you may have heard about, or you may even know people of other races who, who have what they call an alcohol allergy, or they get the the the, the flush or the glow from drinking alcohol where they get very drunk very quickly. They tend to get very red. They tend to get very giddy and giggly. Just that one, a sensitivity to alcohol, a sensitivity to sulfites, like especially in wine. So if wine makes somebody feel worse than other types of alcohol, like they get a bad hangover or they get, I used to get really argumentative on red wine and I get very red ears. I was sensitive to sulfites back then. I was molybdenum deficient. Boy, I fixed that. I don't drink wine anymore, but I don't get that anymore. So sensitive to alcohol, sensitive to wine and sulfites, sensitive to caffeine, that's the xanthine oxidase. Sense, uh, if you get sulfur gas a lot, you're farting out sulfur. And I'm just, this is just an extra thing. If you have a lot of history, or if you have any history of fungal issues or yeast issues, you have a molybdenum deficiency. Funguses and yeast love aldehydes. They love it. So gosh, there's no clinical signs of dietary molybdenum deficiency. How did I figure all these things out? It's just, it's just called biochemistry, folks. So now they're going to say there, wait, so there's no biochemical markers of molybdenum status. So they would have no, do you see how stupid this sounds? There are no biochemical markers of molybdenum status. There are no reports of clinical signs of dietary molybdenum deficiency in otherwise healthy humans. They're saying they couldn't find their ass from a hole in the ground about molybdenum. They're saying they don't know anything about it.
Cereal products are the main contributors to molybdenum dietary intakes, um, estimated to be this much in Nordic studies, 100 to 170 micrograms a day. Well, actually, beans have a lot more molybdenum than cereal products. Not that maybe Nordics are not eating a lot of beans. Little data are available on molybdenum toxicity in humans. Gosh, you mean they have crap data. A tolerable upper intake level of molybdenum has been based on reproductive toxicity in rats, but the effects have not been reproduced in more recent studies. Okay, so they gave rats enough molybdenum that they got birth defects. Okay, so they... You can take too much of anything, okay? The US IOM established a RDA of 45 micrograms a day in adult men and women in 2001 based on a small study, one study reporting urinary excretion imbalance with intake at 22 micrograms per day. One study, small study, that's how they're basing your RDA of molybdenum. Does this sound like they know anything about what they're talking about? The European Food Safety Authority considered in 2013 the evidence to be insufficient. Now, wait, now the evidence is insufficient to derive an average requirement in a population reference intake, but proposed an adequate intake of 65 micrograms per day for adults. So wait, let me just guess. The science on molybdenum is absolute horse shite. So let's go into molybdenum cofactor deficiency and you need molybdenum to make it. So don't forget that. Severe cystic degeneration and intractable seizures in a newborn with molybdenum cofactor deficiency type B. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. Newborns with cystic degeneration with or without intractable seizures should be investigated for inborn errors of metabolism, including molybdenum cofactor deficiency. Wait, did I, did I do this one? No, let me, let me share this one. I don't know if I shared it. Let's do this one now. Molybdenum cofactor deficiency, report of three cases presenting as hypoxic, that's not enough oxygen, ischemic, that's not enough blood flow, basically, encephalopathy, swelling, inflammation of the brain. We conclude that molybdenum cofactor deficiency must be included in the differential diagnosis of patients presenting with intractable seizures in the newborn period. Well, why don't we look at it in adults too? I mean, wait, we don't test magnesium, we don't test zinc, we don't test selenium. We don't test molybdenum. And yet, there's all this research saying that we should. Are you seeing that they, they want you poisoned? Molybdenum cofactor deficiency and seizures. The clinical, biochemical, and neuropathological findings in two neonates with molybdenum cofactor deficiency presenting with convulsions are reported from the Academic Medical Center, Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Here's something that's interesting, folks. Why are you not hearing in any of these things? Why are they not giving these children molybdenum? Have you seen that once? I didn't see it at all. Molybdenum cofactor deficiency mimics cerebral palsy. Usually when you see something like this, folks, it means that it's part of the cause of cerebral palsy. They just can't tell the difference that well. And they just said in that big paper that molybdenum science is total garbage. But they wouldn't even know what they were looking for. Differentiating factors for diagnosis. So the way to differentiate between cerebral palsy that's caused by something else versus molybdenum deficiency. We describe an infant with molybdenum cofactor deficiency, initially diagnosed as cerebral palsy. Clinical features of molybdenum cofactor deficiency, e.g. neonatal seizures, hypertonus, hypotonus, so muscles that are too tight or too floppy, and feeding and respiratory difficulties resemble those of neonatal hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Our patient, a two-year-old boy, presented with spastic quadriplegia and mental retardation. He manifested intractable neonatal seizures and diffuse cerebral atrophy. Did they, did they say they gave him molybdenum? No. 
they they didn't give him molybdenum. Isn't that weird? Okay. Potassium. I'm going to review this one more time. I went over a testimonial in the last live stream or the one before that. I don't remember which one. What we are finding now, folks, is that a fair number of people, I'm not saying everybody, I'm not saying do it. Okay, so this is a really important thing to use your big kid brain on. Can people not eat enough salt? Yes. Can people quite easily eat too much salt? Yes. Both can be present in different people at different times. The people who I see who absolutely refuse to salt their food, they often are unwell in ways that I can't fix because they, they're just like, well, I never salted my food growing up. My mom never had a salt shaker around the house and I just got used to it and I just eat all my food without any salt now. And I'm like, you better start salting your food a little bit or you're not going to get better because that's what I've seen. Then we're finding a lot of people in the program because I gave people carte blanche to salt their food to taste that people are adding obscene amounts of salt to their stuff and they're causing themselves problems because of too much salt. Yes, you can do too much salt. Anybody you believe on the internet who's like, you can't eat too much salt. No, they're absolutely dead wrong. Yes, you can eat too much salt. That only makes sense, right? You can have hypernatremia, too much sodium in the blood. You can have hyponatremia, too little salt in the blood. You could cause either of those by drinking too much or too little of water. And then, then you can affect it with, let's say somebody didn't drink much water, so they didn't dilute their blood and they ate way too much salt. What do you think their blood's going to look like? It's going to have too much sodium. They could do the opposite. They could not salt their food at all and they could drink a whole bunch of water and they could over dilute themselves that way. Now, the reason I bring this up is because I'm going into potassium. If you eat way too much salt, sodium, your potassium situation is not going to be good unless you're getting a ton of potassium, which could cause its own issues. So now why am I, you're looking at this paper in front of you, potassium channels and human epileptic phenotypes, an updated overview. I'm just going to show you how potassium channels are connected to epilepsy. Vitamin A blocks potassium channels. Vitamin A ruins the function of potassium channels. You're supposed to have more potassium inside the cell than outside the cell. If you block the proper potassium channels, you will accumulate too much potassium outside of the cell and not enough inside of the cell. This causes problems. This is part of how vitamin A causes problems, migraine drugs, headaches are often caused by vitamin A toxicity. You want to know what headache drugs, migraine drugs affect? They affect potassium channels. You probably have, most people out there are potassium deficient. How you fix that? I don't go over that here. I go over that in the love your liver program. Foods and potentially supplements, but you need to be careful with supplements because they're, they're easy to overdo. So our potassium channels, which are blocked by vitamin A connected to epilepsy. Let's go into that. Potassium channels are expressed in almost every cell and are ubiquitous or found almost everywhere in neuronal nerve and glial cell membranes. These channels have been implicated in different disorders in particular in epilepsy. Hmm. So imagine this, let's say vitamin A blocks potassium channels and potassium channels are particularly implicated in epilepsy and you reduce your vitamin A toxicity, which means you stop blocking the potassium channels and then the epilepsy gets better. And then maybe even you eat more potassium so you can refill the inside of the cells better now that your potassium channels are working better. Oh, another paper, potassium channels in epilepsy. Hmm. 
going to have to search for this one. No. About 10% of the nearly 80 types of potassium channels are associated with epilepsies and related phenotypes. That's how the epilepsy shows up. That's like the type of seizures. They impact in many ways from the direct control of neuronal excitability to indifferent effects via metabolism. Sounds pretty important, right? 10% of the nearly 80 types of potassium channels are associated with epilepsies. And then even more related phenotypes related to epilepsy. So that might, that's probably other seizures from the direct control of neuronal excitability, vitamin A toxicity affecting potassium channels. The influence of potassium concentration on epileptic seizures in a coupled neuronal model in the hippocampus. Experiments on hippocampal slices have recorded that a novel pattern of epileptic seizures with alternating excitatory and inhibitory activities in the CA1 region can be induced by an elevated potassium ion concentration in the extracellular space between neurons and astrocytes. Where did I tell you you're supposed to have high levels of potassium in the cell? Intracellular. What would happen if you blocked potassium channels so the potassium could not get back inside the cell? Where would you accumulate potassium? Extracellular. They induced epileptic seizure patterns by increasing the extracellular potassium. Extracellular potassium in seizures. Excitation, inhibition, the role of IH. So this is one of the things that uh, conventional research medicine gets wrong is they, they often get cause and effect wrong. And they're saying here, seizure activity leads to ex increases in extracellular potassium concentration. Nice uh, misprint, which can result in changes in neuronal passive and active membrane properties as well as population activities. What if you're blocking, they, they just showed that if they increased the extracellular potassium, they induced seizure activity. So was it, it wasn't the seizure activity that increased the extracellular potassium. They just increased the extracellular potassium and then they saw seizure activity. Do you see how they have the cause and effect wrong? So vitamin A, Blocks potassium channels, increases extracellular potassium, seizure activity. Boom. I don't think I had anything else on this one. Wow, they have so... I don't know what they did. They got some mistakes in their, in their word processor. So let's go into this. So before I go into this, I do not give legitimacy to every single nutrient that they talk about in here as in something you need if you have epilepsy. I emphasize the ones that I know that we've already been over in the research and that I help fix people with. I help guide people to fix themselves. Dietary and lifestyle behavior in adults with epilepsy needs improvement. A case control study from Northeastern Poland, 2021. A tendency towards an increase in LDL cholesterol was found in the individuals with epilepsy. What does LDL cholesterol carry again, class? Vitamin A. So more LDL probably means more vitamin A. Not always, but one of the things that Grant, Grant Jenneru proposed early on was that one indirect way of looking at potential vitamin A toxicity was to look at LDL cholesterol. It's one of many markers, potentially. It's not the only one. Patients with epilepsy were more sedentary. You, folks, if you want to be healthy, you got to move your body somehow. If you're so sick right now that you can't even take a walk, then don't take a walk yet and work on work harder on your diet and your toxicity and your nutrition. But once you can exercise, once you can walk, you should be walking. Once you can start doing some sort of strength training and cardio. 
Acti cardio activity. It doesn't have to be on a stupid machine in a gym. Once you, you want to, I'll put it this way. This is the very simple way to think of it. If you're going to do cardio, it's, pro it's better to do it longer and slower. If you're going to do strength training, it's better to do it heavier and shorter. doesn't mean you have to go and hurt yourself, but you want, don't, okay. I was, i I helped co-found the first CrossFit gym in Arizona in 2005. I'm totally familiar with HIIT training and overly stupid, aggressive, push yourself to the limit training. I am very familiar. I'm familiar. I, I power lifted. I Olympic lifted. I train gymnastic strength stuff. I've done all this stuff. Make your easy training easy and make your hard training difficult. Doesn't mean you need to hurt yourself, but don't stay in the middle is what I'm saying. This middle thing where you're like trying to get your cardio and your strength training from the same stuff, like CrossFit ish, Orange Theory ish, F45 ish. This is, this is not very good for you. Walking and strength training, walking a long time and strength training is the best. So, so don't be sedentary. Once you can not, once you can not be sedentary and you can do some exercise like Will's doing pickleball. I don't care what it is. Do something, do something you like, but get off your ass. Humans are designed to move. If you can't, if you have fibromyalgia so bad that you can't move, that's okay. You're really, really toxic. You're really, really deficient. Fix those things and you will feel better. And then you can start moving your body. Okay. So patients with epilepsy consumed less potassium and consumed more sugar, sweetened soda, fat, and sodium than healthy people. They consume less potassium and more sodium. Is this sounding like something I just talked about? Sugar. Let's go drink Mexican Cokes. No, don't. No. <laughs> Do I have to explain it? Okay, no more super chats, y'all. I got to get to the super chats that are already there. No, I, If you post any more super chats after now, it's moving over to next week. So... A higher percentage of the patients with epilepsy had diets that were low in niacin and potassium than the control group. A significantly lower serum concentration of vitamin D was observed in epileptic individuals and was found to be positively mod. The lower level of vitamin D was found to be positively modulated or increased by physical activity. They didn't say time outside. They said physical activity. You want to know what you can raise your vitamin D levels with in terms of minerals we talked about today? Zinc raises vitamin D levels. Magnesium raises vitamin D levels. Protein raises vitamin D levels. And apparently physical activity raises vitamin D levels. Which one of those involves taking rat poison vitamin D3 pills? None of them. Lower niacin. Oh, vitamin C. If you haven't seen my episode on scurvy in the live stream, you should watch my episode on scurvy. Vitamin C deficiency or scurvy is vitamin A toxicity. Okay. Low in niacin, low in potassium. So let's go in. I think we're getting close to the niacin stuff now. Hold on. Is this the same one? No, this is another one on. Thanks, Joe, for the uh, send dog breath for the uh, super chat uh, warning. Um, nutritional intake and its impact on patients with epilepsy, an analytical cross-sectional study. You may see some things that we push in the Love Your Liver program here. In patients with epilepsy, there was insufficient intake of water, fiber, potassium, magnesium, and some vitamins. The only ones I'm going to give any 
B12, eh, it's an antidote. Folate. Folate. Oh, if you haven't seen B12 and folate, make sure to watch the video on this channel about how vitamin A has been shown to deplete B12 and folate. Vitamin A depletes B12 and folate. I have the evidence. I present a lot of it. Oh, and they're deficient in niacin. And they have suboptimal intakes of calories. Did I talk about not eating enough? Zinc. They talk here about B1. B1 is an antidote. It binds to aldehydes. They talk on here about over intake of proteins. I don't, th I don't think this is right. But they do talk about over intake of vitamins D and B2. What color is B2, folks? B2 is yellow. Yellow is generally, B2 makes your pee really yellow because your body's trying to pee it out so fast. Be careful of B2. <laughs> Those with optimal caloric intake were 80% less likely to have uncontrolled seizures than those with too much caloric intake. What would eating more get you, folks? If you're eating a toxic diet, it gets you more toxins. Macro and micronutrient intake were unbalanced in patients with epilepsy. But did you see how niacin showed up? Potassium, magnesium, zinc, all these things that I'm talking about. Let's keep going. This one is for Kelsey. If Hopefully she's still here. So do you know the nutritional deficiency that was caused by ma uh, mostly corn diets that were not treated with lime uh, limestone, right? That nixtamalization. Just look, look up here. Let me type it in. Um, here, I'm going to type it in the chat. This is the term nixtamalization. So they, they had to do, they had to treat the corn to break it down so that it would, um, free up the, the, the niacin so that people would not get pellagra, also known as niacin deficiency, from corn-heavy diets. Yeah, I need some water, Joe. I'm just, I'm sitting here with no water. And we're at like what? <laughs> Four hours. <clears throat> yeah, I need some water. Let me clear my throat again. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm, I'm getting, I'm just getting hoarse from the lack of water. And I'm not going to get up. Humans can still eat corn, but you got to prepare it. So, white corn. If you're going to eat corn, eat white corn. Less vitamin A. Chronic malnutrition caused by a corn-based diet lowers the threshold for pentaline, pentaline tetrazole induced seizures in rats. So a corn-based diet would reduce niacin status. We just saw niacin was low in several dietary studies. Didn't we, there was also a niacin study. Oh, the NAD study where you need NAD to run ALDH and nicotinic acid, AKA flush niacin is what runs that best. We connecting it all. So what's the chronic malnutrition caused by a corn-based diet? Well, it could be lack of protein, could be lack of zinc, could be lack of taurine, could be lack of niacin. Gosh, we didn't cover how any of those are problems with seizures, did we? The incidence of epilepsy is high in developing countries where malnutrition is prevalent. They don't eat meat very much at all. Although malnutrition is not a direct cause of seizures, chronic malnutrition may predispose the brain to seizures. In large undernourished human groups from Latin America, the most common sources of food are corn and corn derivatives. Let me let me just emphasize this. In the vitamin A deficiency doesn't exist study, in the 80s, they said there was a high prevalence of vitamin A deficiency in Latin America, and yet they couldn't find vitamin A deficiency eye diseases at all. Why couldn't they? Their blood tests showed deficiency. Deficiency. Why weren't they having eye problems? Because vitamin A deficiency doesn't exist. 
So the most common sources of food are corn and corn derivatives. We used a rat model of chronic malnutrition in which corn tortillas were the only solid food intake to study the possible influence of malnutrition at late stages of brain development on the dynamics of experimental seizures induced by pentaline tetrazole. The threshold and dose of PTZ required to produce seizures was greatly reduced in malnourished rats. The model of malnutrition used in the study imitates a form of malnutrition common among large numbers of humans. Our results suggest that chronic malnutrition early in life induces changes that lower the seizure threshold and leave the brain more susceptible to seizures. Whether this observation relates to the high incidence of epilepsy in underdeveloped countries remains to be determined. Huh? Malnourishment, protein deficiency, calorie deficiency, not enough protein, not enough zinc, probably, I mean, if you're talking corn tortillas and all that, not enough selenium, not enough molybdenum, not enough niacin, probably not enough potassium or magnesium. It's just a disaster. And you're seeing it's, your diseases are toxicities and deficiencies. So now here, let's go. Nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. That's NAD. The best thing you can take to make this is nicotinic acid or flush niacin. It suppresses epileptogenesis, the, cre the start, the creation of epilepsy at an early stage. Wow. Weird. Numerous reports have shown that NAD has neuroprotective effects, suggesting its potential use for treating epileptogenesis. Here we evaluated the effects of NAD on epileptogenesis and the mechanisms underlying those effects. In pilocarpine-induced status epilepticus, I want you to just think about how many different poisons are they giving animals to induce epilepsy? Epilepsy is toxicities and deficiencies that just inject animals with poison and they get seizures. In pilocarpine-induced status epilepticus model mice, NAD was injected three times within 24 and a half hours after status epilepticus. NAD intervention significantly reduced the incidence of spontaneous recurrent seizure and abnormal EEG activity, rescued contextual fear memory formation, reduced neuronal nerve loss in the CA1 region of the hippocampus at SRS stage. Furthermore, exogenous supply of NAD distinctly reverse the seizure-induced depletion of endogenous made from within the body, NAD, reduced neuronal apoptosis in the CA1 region of the hippocampus and reversed the augmented ACP53 slash P53 ratio at the early stage of epileptogenesis. Our findings in demonstrated that early stage intervention with NAD prevents epileptogenesis in pilocarpine-induced status epilepticus mice by suppressing neuronal apoptosis or pre-programmed cell death. Don't take NAD. It doesn't, it doesn't get into the cells. Do not take NAD as pills. They injected it here. Don't inject NAD either. Just take your flush niacin. It's what I did just now. There's directions on how to take it in the love your liver program, how to dose it, how to buffer it, how to use charcoal as a binder. And then you can just get it from Kelsey if you just want to get the charcoal and the niacin and the magnesium nicotinate and the potassium nicotinate. I think it's all in there. If you don't want to make it, if you don't want to be like a little kitchen chemist and mix it all together and measure it out and all that stuff, then just get it from Kelsey. She's got her, it's already made. So here's an interesting thing. I just want to show you how silly, like, right, how silly medicine is. So what did they make here? Protective action of nicotinic acid, which is what I'm talking about, flush niacin, nicotinic acid, bound to benzylamide. That doesn't sound good. Benzylamide does not sound good at all to me. In a variety of chemically induced seizures in mice. So they can give mice chemically induced seizures from a bunch of different ingredients, right? But I want you to see that this is probably part of this molecule is good and part of this molecule is toxic. 
what do you think they're going to find? Do you think, let me, let me foreshadow this. Do you think they're going to find some benefits and some toxicity? I should do like the Johnny Carson, like holding the envelope on my forehead. This study aims to assess the anti-convulsant effects offered by benzylamide nicotinic acid in many animal models of chemically induced seizures. PTZ, PILO, BIC, AMPA, KA, and NMDA. I am busy. <laughs> so... We got this going on. We already know that niacin stops, helps with seizures, NAD. Nicotinic acid makes NAD. Additionally, it analyzes side effects of administering nicotinic BZA in the form of loss of coordination and memory impairment as evaluated in the rotorod and passive avoidance tests respectively. So anti-seizure activity of nicotinic acid, benzylalamide, was reported in numerous models of chemically induced seizures. We already know that nicotinic acid helps with seizures. The evaluation of the side effects present shortly after dosing in the rotorod test has revealed neurotoxicity of nicotinic acid benzyl benzylalamide with experimentally determined TD50 value of 188.5 milligrams per kilogram. Summing up, Nicotinic acid benzylamide has a wide anticonvulsant effect in different experimental epilepsy models. Did you not figure out that it's the nicotinic acid in there? And that putting the benzylamide is toxic? Like this doesn't seem that hard to me. One of them is an essential nutrient. Nicotinic acid is an amino acid. It's not a B vitamin. It's derived from tryptophan, another amino acid. So let's see. Wait, let's go to this one. Oh, so this is, this is some fun stuff. This is just some extra stuff. Charcoal, some charcoal is something we like here. Multi-dose activated charcoal in the treatment of carbamazepine overdose with seizures, a case report. Did I post this one? No, let me post the link. What does charcoal soak up? Charcoal soaks up toxic bile, copper, vitamin A, and other toxic things like, oh, I don't know, excessive farms cartel medications. Charcoal does not soak up good nutrients. There is no evidence in the literature of any nutrient deficiency ever being caused by charcoal. There's one study where they put charcoal into apple juice. And then they tried to tell you that charcoal will deplete your nutrients. Why would they not want you to use charcoal? Because it's helpful. Serious complications after carbamazepine poisoning, such as seizures. We report a case of a single massive carbamazepine overdose in a 19-year-old male following attempted suicide without prior history of seizure disorder. The patient was intubated and treated with multiple doses of activated charcoal for 48 hours. Carbamazepine serum level fell within the therapeutic range 63 hours after ingestion, and the patient was discharged without any long-term sequelae. I'm sure there was some long-term sequelae. As there is no antidote for carbamazepine poisoning, and they, and they antidote it with charcoal. Supportive treatment remains the only but usually potent option. Supported charcoal is only supportive. <sighs> Can't have people, you know, if you guys don't know here in America, like in Europe, for all sorts of gastrointestinal problems, they use charcoal all the time. You got tummy ache, charcoal. You got nausea, charcoal. You got vomiting, charcoal. You got diarrhea, charcoal. What are all those problems related to? Bile. What does charcoal soak up? Bile. Repeat charcoal hemoperfusion treatments in life-threatening carbamazepine overdose. 
Hemoperfusion. Let's go look up the definition of that just so everybody's clear. A procedure in which drugs or toxins are removed from a patient's blood by passing it through a column of charcoal or other adsorbent material. Hemoperfusion, removal of toxins or metabolites from the blood within a suitable extracorporeal, that means within outside of their body, circuit. It is a method of filtering the blood extracorporeally to remove a toxin. Why aren't doctors doing this all the time to everybody? Hmm? I need to look this up more. Because if I were to ever have a retreat, I might have to do this. Hemoperfusion. I'm going to have to look that up more. So repeat charcoal hemoperfusion treatments and life-threatening carbamazepine overdose. So they're using charcoal again. They're just filtering the blood through charcoal. I'm not going to read all this. So the patient tried to poison themselves. Sorry, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> they took all this carbamazepine. They got seizures, coma, shock. Well, I'm sorry, not there. That's what could happen. Clinical manifestations include generalized seizures, coma, shock, and gastrointestinal hypomotility. Gastroparesis. Gastroparesis is one of, so bile can paralyze things. Gastroparesis is a paralyzed stomach. Gut decontamination was attempted using multiple dose activated charcoal and cathartics. It doesn't quite work well enough. So then they went into charcoal hemoperfusion. Three sessions. They got it down. No complications. Oh. Charcoal. They filtered the blood through charcoal. No complications. They give charcoal. No complications. Why are they not giving charcoal for all sorts of things? Because they want you sick. Charcoal hemoperfusion should be considered for life-threatening carbamazepine intoxication, especially when drug-induced gastrointestinal hypomotility presents elim prevents elimination via the gut. Charcoal in a constipated person is not helpful because it may constipate you more. I don't care what other people are saying out there. If there's a couple people who say that charcoal in low doses constipated them and charcoal in high doses helped them poop more, that doesn't mean you run out. If you know charcoal constipates you and take a bunch, what's the only one bad thing that can happen from charcoal? Megacolon, toxic megacolon, where people took so much charcoal and it and it, there, it was too dehydrated and they made almost no bile that, that blocked up their gut. That's the only thing you can do wrong with charcoal is take too much and block up your gut. So don't do stupid things. We don't blow through things. Just like I said earlier, if you're out there and you wanted to blow through it and you decided to do it on your own, I'm not advising that. I'm not risking my career to try to push people through things. The one problem that you could cause with charcoal is too much and blocking up your guts. So if you decide to go and listen to somebody on the internet who says, take more, it, it helped me poop more. And you decide to do more and it blocks you up for five days. You better not take even more. Doc, it hurts when I do this. Well, don't do that. More is not going to fix it. Okay. Hey, folinic acid, my favorite. Can't buy it anymore. They made it, they made it prescription only. Wonder why they're taking that away from people. Folinic acid responsive neonatal seizures. Folate. Calcium folinate or folinic acid. We report three cases of folinic acid responsive intractable neonatal seizures. Seizures stopped within 24 hours of starting folinic acid. Actually, am I wrong? Is folate necessary for ALDH2? Let me check. 
It might be. Here, let me show you what I'm looking at. FDH, an aldehyde dehydrogenase fusion enzyme in folate metabolism. I'm not going to go into all these ALDH1, L1, and ALDH1, L2 folates, probably folate responsive, folate alcohol and aldehyde, aldehyde dehydrogenase. So yes, folate is involved in aldehyde dehydrogenase. We already went over that. If you're eating beans, you're getting, if you're eating beans on a regular basis, you're, you're getting plenty of folate from that. But obviously these children, what do we know about vitamin A toxicity? It depletes folate too. The exact same birth defects that are linked to folate deficiency are the exact same as vitamin A toxicity, are the exact same as alcohol induced birth defects, are the exact same as glyphosate induced birth defects. Folate deficiency. Okay, we got that one. We know vitamin A toxicity depletes folate. We know that um, alcohol depletes folate. Alcohol uses up your ALDH. Glyphosate messes with your vitamin A detox. Do you see how all of these connect? They're all connected. to Oh, and, and alcohol kicks vitamin A out of your liver into your blood. We have the research on that. So vitamin A, uh, yeah, alcohol kicks vitamin A out in your blood, which would then increase your toxicity level because that's where the problems happen is when it's in your blood. How else would the vitamin A that was stored in your liver get to the fetus to cause birth defects? Drink alcohol, kick it out of your liver into the blood, it goes to the fetus. Oh, I thought I'd go over this one. You know how ladies, I'm saying you can hand down ladies and men, men, you're what you hand down men is you hand down damaged sperm. So your, con your contribution to the whole, you know, it'd be like if, if the blueprints to build your child were bad, right? The end product's going to be bad. So think of the man as contributing a big part of the blueprint via the sperm. And then the woman is like the building of the house based off the blueprint. So if you have a bad blueprint, you can build something bad. And if you don't have the right materials or the right workers or enough energy or all that stuff, too much toxic stuff, you can build a bad house. So both the men and the women are handing down their toxicities and their deficiencies in their own way. The placenta, just so you know, don't eat the placenta. The placenta is a third liver. Don't eat it. It's toxic. Throw it away. Bury it. If you want to do like, you know, a woo ritual and bury your placenta, like what? Go ahead. Just don't eat it. I saw somebody making like placenta smoothies on Twitter. And I was, I was like, I almost retched. It was like pink and just, oh. Maternal epilepsy, so mothers with epilepsy. Perinatal, that means around the birth, outcome, and long-term neurological morbidity of the offspring, a population-based cohort study. Conclusions. The pregnancy of epileptic women is independently associated with the adverse perinatal outcome, so bad outcomes at the birth, as well as a higher risk for long-term neurological morbidity diseases, neurological diseases of the offspring. You are handing down your toxicities and deficiencies. This is why I have people do the, the, the love your liver, low vitamin A and all that other stuff for at least six months before you get pregnant. Don't be pregnant and start the full detox. I'm not, I say, don't do that. I say, you can do basics for like, I mean, do the, do the program for six months before you get pregnant. If you're pregnant already and you want to start reducing your vitamin A intake and reducing some of that stuff, just don't go crazy. Just start, you know, st take out the sweet potatoes for 
criminy sake. Take out the spinach, take out the kale, take out the egg yolks, take out, you know, take out the basics. Don't go crazy. Not while you're pregnant. You may have to wait until you're done being pregnant to really start the detox. Okay. Is that it? That's it. Did I show you enough causes of epilepsy here and how they're all connected? It's kind of cool, isn't it? Let me blow my nose after that sneeze. I'm still a little. Okay. Oh, thanks, Will. Well, we're, we're only at like four hours. And I think I got a family member knocking at me to wondering when the heck I'm going to get out of here. Um, so let me go to the super chats. Joe, is that still all the super chats? I think other than like Zen dog saying to not send any more super chats and Gabe saying he'll see me in the inner circle. Anyway, here we go. Vince, thank you for the super chat. Why do I dislike coconuts? Any research? Okay. So first of all, they just became popular so quick and they were, it's just, it's using them for everything. It's remember soy when it came out, soy came out and they're like every thing made with soy and every part of soy and we can ferment it and we can culture it and we can make it into this and we can make it into that and we can give you soy protein shakes and we can give you soy oil and we can so so like soy protein and then there's like coconut flour and then there's soy oil and there's coconut oil and then there's coconut charcoal and it's just it's the same damn thing and then there's people out there oh i don't know like people who are into Weston price. And they were saying that just like basically eating coconut oil was going to fix your thyroid. What a crock. How many of you out there tried the coconut oil fix for your thyroid and it didn't do anything or maybe it made you fat. Like I don't trust. I mean, first of all, I'm, I'm 97 and a half percent Scandinavian. When in the world in my, in my genetic development would i have ever been exposed to coconuts most people in the world have never you know long term been exposed to coconuts but then all of a sudden it's the healthiest thing for everybody next thing coconut is generally i believe high in palmitic acid the most common way the body stores vitamin a in the liver is vitamin a palmitate that is the most common supplement of vitamin a if you want to say synthetic form but that is also your body will take vitamin A that's floating around your blood, retinol, and bind it to palmitic acid that you consume, make it into retinol palmitate via choline and shove it in your liver. And vitamin E intake will increase that too. So I just don't think, I'm not totally anti-coconut, but when people are like making coconut flour and they're using coconut milk and they're doing coconut charcoal, people are telling me, I mean, I learned this coconut charcoal is what do they do with all the coconut shells? They turn them into coconut charcoal. Do they care if it's moldy or not? No, it's, they just need a coconut shell. They can, they can bake and then they can turn it into charcoal. So they're, they're baking moldy coconut shells, turning it into coconut charcoal. Almost the only coke, the only, almost the only charcoal you can find out there now is coconut. Hardwood is getting hard to find. Zen principles, the brand I use generally, I'm going to, I'm going to talk to my supplement manufacturer about getting my own loose charcoal. Bamboo charcoal is okay too. I, I don't, I don't trust coconut, coconut water once in a while is okay, but even still coconut water does have some estrogenic effect. They actually use it in like the Philippines and Indonesia as a treatment for, um, menopause symptoms. It's got enough estrogenic effect that it's used there for that. So I might have a coconut water once every two weeks, maybe after I've been out like at a shooting competition and out in the heat. Cause it does, it does help. I need a lot of potassium after I do that stuff. And coconut water is a good way of getting that. That doesn't overdo it for me. So I just, I just, if you're drinking it every day, that's fine. But if you want to work on finding better sources of potassium and magnesium, that's cool. But I do not trust the coconut marketing. If it was not good for, if it was, if it was really that good for people, they would have started restricting it kind of like soy. And now, and now everybody's like, soy was so bad. I can't believe we did that. And I'm like, did you see the coconut fad? 
It's still going on. I don't trust it. That's all. Okay, Carol, thank you for the super chat. She says, I've recently taken lymphomyosite and lactoferrin and been highly nauseous for a week. Taking double my previous charcoal dose helps just a little. I have polyps in the gallbladder. How can I stop nausea? Okay, this is this is fairly simple. So this is not, this is a lesson for everybody here. Did you read the lactoferrin instructions that are linked on the bottle, also linked on the product page? I give very, very detailed instructions about how to go up slowly on the lactoferrin because one of the things lactoferrin is very good at doing is increasing bile production. What do we associate nausea with in this program? Too much bile in the stomach. Could the lactoferrin be increasing your bile production so fast that you're refluxing it back up into the stomach and giving yourself nausea? Absolutely. Lactoferrin can cause any of the symptoms that you could get from toxic bile. So lactoferrin, so think of it this way, strong medicines, and I'm going to, I'm referring to lactoferrin as a medicine here right now. Strong medicines have strong effects for better or worse. Lactoferrin is a very strong medicine, if you want to call it that. I mean, it's derived from dairy milk, but it, you know, it's, and it's, it's potent. Some of you here in the chat, you may want to comment about how potent it is, especially our stuff. Um, if you're here later in the comments and you want to comment on how potent the lack, our lactoferrin is like our lactoferrin is the most potent on the market. I truly believe this. We're like one of the only companies, one of two or three at the most companies in the U.S. actually selling the Ingredia lactoferrin, the pro diet lactoferrin. And I think the other company that sells it, um, the other company that sells it is using 60 milligrams in their pill and ours, ours are 315 milligrams per pill. So we're selling the highest dose of it. I talk about with the lactoferrin opening a capsule and using the, starting with the one sixty fourth of a teaspoon. Not much. I specifically say, if you jump in at a pill, if that's what you did, Carol, if you jumped in at a pill, you jumped into the deep end and you're kind of kicking your own butt. As I say here, how do we address this? Well, doc, it hurts when I do this. Well, then don't do that. So do less. You probably would do well to take a, I actually talk about this in the lactoferrin instructions. If you think your problems may be related five milligrams. Okay. So it's, it's still very strong. Um, if there's anybody out there in the chat who wants to comment about how you might've tried like some, like just the tip of a finger and it was still too much for you. If that's too much, then that's too much. You gotta, you gotta respect the lactoferrin. So it's probably not, if it, if it was the lymphomyosis, I mean, first what I would do, if those are two new, th if those are two relatively new things that you're adding, take a break from both of them for like three days to a week, just to stop them. And then when you reintroduce them, you're only going to reintroduce one thing at a time for a whole week. If you want to reintroduce the lactoferrin five milligrams, however you measured that for a week and see if it causes the nausea, maybe I would probably give it two weeks because the lactoferrin can take a while to build up. And then you see if the lactoferrin was the cause of it. If it was, then you either need to take less than five milligrams or not take it yet. It just means yet. Over time, people are able to take, they're usually able to take some of it at least. But if you're at the start of this whole process or in the early phases or even in the first year, you may not be able to take it. It doesn't mean the lactoferrin's bad. It means it's too powerful for you right now. If it's the lymphomyosot, that's that's a homeopathic combination that would be just if it's if it's not working it's it may not work for you but it may work in the future i don't think it's the lymphomyosot my first suspicion is the uh is the lactoferrin now if you're dumping too much bile i mean the easy thing to do here 
you could think of, could you, you say you're taking charcoal helps just a little. Well, what you can do to calm this down, stop the lactoferrin, stop the lymphomyosot, see if the nausea goes away pretty quick, which would probably, it'd probably go away within a week, I'd guess. Do more, to, you can do the charcoal during it to see if that calms it down. But yeah, with anybody out there, I think I talked about this on the uh, lactoferrin show. You might want to go and watch the lactoferrin show, Carol, if you haven't already. Um, people with acid reflux, which is really bile reflux, lactoferrin will aggravate the heck out of it because you've already got bile going in your stomach. And if you increase the production of bile, you just get more bile in your stomach and it does not feel good. People with acid reflux, AKA bile reflux cannot take lactoferrin until that problem has gone away. So you suffered from acid reflux. So you have a tendency towards it. Yeah. So yeah, it absolutely. It's the lactoferrin. I, I 99% positive. So just take a break from it. Maybe you can't do it yet. Do the charcoal. You, I would stop the lymphomyosot too, and then reintroduce the lymphomyosot. And then I would work on the low dose niacin, the instructions in the, in the program. And then if you want to, maybe when you get up to that again, then maybe you work on the higher dose niacin before the lactoferrin, because sometimes people tolerate one better than the other. But yeah, that's it's it's most likely the lactoferrin, especially if you have a history of acid reflux. It just really increases the bile production, so you got to watch out. Okay, moving on from Will. Looking at my labs, looks like high reverse T three is my main and only thyroid issue. Guess what raises reverse T three? Copper. Um, he says best doc NA high reverse T3 reduces metabolism. Yeah. So Will sent me a message this morning and I just, thank you, Will. Thank you very much for the super chat and the compliment. Um, well, Will, Will's posted his copper results on Twitter before, so I don't think he minds me saying it, but Will, Will has, Will has significantly high copper for a guy like, Will, you may have the highest copper I've seen in a guy other than a, a kid with a metabolic disorder. I saw a kid with 222 was what his mom told me his highest copper was. And they said, listen to this. They said when they did the, um, what's the, not dialysis. What was, what was Grant talking about? Were they plasma phoresis? His mom told me that when they did plasma phoresis on him, usually plasma phoresis comes out yellow. Well, gosh, what's yellow that's in the blood in sick people where they do plasma phoresis, bile and vitamin A. This kid's plasma phoresis bag was light blue. What might make a plasma phoresis bag light blue? Oh, copper. So yeah. So copper is a, but that was, that was at 222 or something. I mean, this kid had a, you know, a port for like treatment therapies and stuff. You know, it was, this kid was, was messed up. He was, he was living a pretty decent life though for being that sick. Um, but yeah, plasma phoresis is so expensive. When I, the, the hemo perfusion, really, I got to look into that. I really got to look into that. Imagine how much toxicity we could take out of people running their blood through a charcoal filter. Then we could get to the toxicity in the blood right away. Yeah. So let's go. Okay. So we have Carol says, Hey, what do you recommend for chlamydia? I don't the same as we do for everything else. Is Bolotov acid beneficial? I don't know. Is that boric acid? I don't know what Bolotov, that just seems like it might be something else for. Yeah, well, charcoal dialysis, that's basically what hemoperfusion is. Let me, hold on, let me look up Bolotov. Um, let me stop sharing this one. There we go. Greater salandine, uh, it's just another alkaloid. It's an herb. It's gonna, it's gonna 
do what it does and probably affect the liver negatively. Um, if you wanted to, there is a website. Um, I'm going to type it in the chat. I would look into like, let's say, well, I'll just, I'll just do this. Let me do this. Oh, I need to go and share again. Hold on. I got it, Joe. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> okay. Let me do that and that, and then let's go to here, here, here. So let's say you were to go to this website and you were to type in this word. So I want you to look in here. Chlamydia successfully healed. Um, here's another one on chlamydia, chlamydia. I have seen this compound eradicate swine flu, herpes, and chlamydia to name just a few microbes. Yay for MMS. Um, guy had epididymitis and prostatitis that he suspected came from a case of chlamydia he had in the past. So anyway, in the Love Your Liver program, there is a section that talks about this compound. There's lots of free eBooks on how to use it and take it that I did not write. We do not sell this compound, but you can find it easily enough and you can ask other people how to find it, where to find it, how to use it. And like I said, there's all the, the free information in the Love Your Liver program. But when people have a very specific issue, especially that they believe is related to a pathogen, then you could consider doing this. I suggest going to this website and putting in your search term here and seeing if it helps. How does this thing help? It's an oxidizer. Your detox pathways are mainly oxidative. So this is basically doing your detox pathway work for you. The thing you must realize is once the issue is gone, you stop using it. You don't keep using it forever. Okay. So that's that. Let me look at the next one. Oh, Jason says, is natokinase safe to take? Studies show it reduces arterial plaque. Someday, Kelsey and I are going to do our P-glycoprotein inhibitor stuff, but natokinase is, right, it's getting pushed by the alternative side. The, uh, what's, what's the group? What's the COVID the alternative COVID group. Um, oh, the wellness company and all that stuff. And I forget the AAA. There's like three A's in it. I don't even care. Natokinase and MK7, the, the form of vitamin K2, are made by Bacillus cereus, which is a sewage bacteria. Let me show you. Let's just go to PubMed. Joe, I'll bring it up. Don't worry. <laughs> Let me go in here. Uh -huh. Screen. We'll go here, here, share. Okay. Yeah, Ed, Ed, Zen Dog Breath has a little background on on the the group. Um, Peter McCullough, Pierre Corey, Robert Malone, all working for a Blackwater former employee. Do you trust Blackwater? I don't. Do you think they all of a sudden took your health into mind? Once a spook, always a spook. Robert Malone, once a spook, always a spook. Former Blackwater employees, once a spook, always a spook. 
Once a CIA spook, always a CIA spook. Once a government scientist, still a spook. Don't trust former employees of the government. All they did was they changed their title. They're still working for the same people, or maybe they're working for even worse people. And what they do is they use their, I'm an ex, I'm a whistleblower. You think they'd actually let whistleblowers live if they had anything that, that was really not supposed to be said? Seriously? This is the enzyme. This is the pro the bacteria that makes natokinase and MK7. Just we're just gonna take a browse through how many times we see this word, this this bacteria with sewage. Bacillus serious sewage. Sewage is in there too. Bacillus serious sludge samples. Use of bacterial spores, sewage contamination. Let me, I should do this a little better. Let me do this. We're going to do an advanced search. So if you ever want to do an advanced search on PubMed, the easiest way, do a title abstract search for Bacillus Sirius. We're going to add that. And sewage search. So that means the words have to FLCCC. Yes. Yes. FLCCCC. I don't trust them at all. Everything they're telling quercetin is a bioflavonoid that, that slows down ALDH. Um, what else was there? There's vitamin D, which slows down ALDH too, I believe. And it also slows down PGP. It's a PGP inhibitor. They push ivermectin, which slows down ALDH, and it's a PGP inhibitor. They push natokinase, which is a PGP inhibitor, as I'll show you in just a second. 26 results with the words bacillus serious and sewage in the title or the abstract. Bacillus serious, sewage, bacillus serious, and the sewage is going to be in there. Bacillus serious. The, all these, so sewage is in the abstract. If it's not, it is a sewage bacteria. So I'm going to say I don't trust sewage bacteria. Okay. Kelsey, if you're here and you want to post the any of the P glycoprotein stuff on natokinase, let me see if I can find it a little easier. Where is it? Oh, wait, sorry. I'm not on the share this tab instead. I'm going to go to PubMed. Kelsey has this research. Um, but MK7, form of K2, does inhibit P glycoprotein and so does natokinase. I don't trust either of them. P MK7 is not too bad, but when I make my product, it will, my vitamin K2 product, it will only be MK4 and, and K1. It will not have any MK7 in it. Working on that. Um, General Patriarchy asks, um, picol, pic, picolinic acid, zinc picolinate, picolinic acid, and nicotinate, nicotinic acid, they they affect the same receptors. They're both derived from tryptophan. It is better that you take them in two separate meals. 
Yes. I'm moving towards using more um What is this? Why did this come up? Anyway, I don't trust them. I don't trust sewage bacteria. A lot of the stuff, ivermectin is like <laughs> bacterial waste. Don't. So let's move to the next one. Is it safe to take? I, I'm just, I'm most arterial plaque. Plaque is it's, it's calcium and cholesterol. What am I telling you? Cholesterol is cholesterol is, is an indicative of toxicity. Calcium. We just talked about calcium and vitamin A toxicity and vitamin D rat poison supplements and copper toxicity and all this stuff. And then the magnesium deficiency. So we, we fix these things without having to take sewage bacteria byproducts. Yeah. So if you want to take it, that's up to you. It's always up to you. You all can take whatever you want. You can be like, I don't believe Dr. Smith at all. Okay, cool. Go ahead. A lot of people come back later and they're like, you were right. And I'm like, You're still welcome back if you make a mistake. I've been around a while though. So you might want to, you know, consider what I'm saying. I've been doing this naturopathic medicine thing since 2006. So yeah, two more super chats. I want to read them. Zen dog breath or, or Joe, as I call him. Um, no more super chats. Damn it. Black oatster cult rules the BOC Daiunchi sand to the rescue. And then brave 16 says no question. Dr. Smith donate donation to the cause. It's Gabe C and in the inner circle shortly. Okay. Oh, and then Joe's new mouse came during the show. So I, I ordered Joe a new mouse to help us with the, uh, the show. So that's, that's all the super chats. And I mean, okay, we didn't quite hit five hours today. <laughs> Apparently, my brain without too much copper and without too much vitamin A, apparently my brain can work pretty well for a pretty long time. I'm supposed to go do the inner circle now, another hour, hour and a half, two hours of questions from people who are in the Love Your Liver Network who pay a separate fee each month to get to ask me as many questions as they want. And that's all I'm doing there is just answering questions. So if you're interested in that and you're in the Love Your Liver program, if you're going to join the Love Your Liver program, that is always an option. There's also the advanced detox, which is where you get to listen to me doing those questions and answers for a lot less money, but you just don't get to ask any questions. So anyway, if you like hearing me talk, you have plenty of options. So anyway, don't forget to like, and subscribe and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, help the algo to find other people. Don't forget to share this. Like I have to go share this with, uh, with the other Garrett, tell him I did a whole show for you, bro. <laughs> Share it with people you know with epilepsy. Yes, it worked on a kid. Make sure to watch that testimonial from the mother. She's not the only one. And we can we can help spread the word. So all my links are down in the info below. And I will see you all hopefully next week. Enjoy your, your week and your weekend. And I'll talk to you later. Bye now. <laughs>